minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. Welcome to episode 355, All-Star Venomous Roundtable with some hitters. Holy shit, I put up a thumbnail I wasn't supposed to put up already, but god damn it, what is good everybody? I'm your boy MJ. If this is your first time tapping into your boy favor, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, uh, hit that notification bell, especially if you're into keeping reptiles, either breeding, admiring, um, you know, overall all the above. This is the channel to be a part of if you're into reptiles, okay? I bring anything that's relevant. The most popping shit comes to this podcast. So I just want to say, first and foremost, shout out to all my subscribers out there. Um, if you listen to me on the other audio platforms, such as Buzzsprout, Apple, Spotify, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Leave me a comment. Um, any feedback is welcome. Shout out to the early birds. I see you guys. I hope you guys are pumped. I know I'm pumped, man. Got a very special podcast, like I said, lined up. Especially for all you venomous lovers out there, because venomous talk is definitely being slept on but not tonight i can tell you that much before we gotta get into things i do want to say that tonight's episode is brought to you by focus cube habitat number one pvc built enclosures in the game all right flex in texas all day every day texas where you at man but give it up for steven and ashley thank you so much steven and ashley for making my podcast room look so next level very proud of it other than the light that just went out which not your fault but i have nothing but focus cube enclosures in this entire room and it's very therapeutic wouldn't want it any other way so thank you so much again Stephen ashley head over to instagram head over to their website focus cube habitats the future of enclosures now here i also want to say if you got eggs you better put them inside of the sim box less steps less stress if it's a sim it's a win all day every day thank you so much john and alex listen if you're into monitors trying to step your monitor game up dwarfs or the large monitor species Sim containers is where it's at. I'm telling you, I've been looking up to John and Alex for quite a minute. They are OGs in the monitor game. And yes, thank you so much, John and Alex. I have about four clutches inside my incubator, all sim containers. All right, guys. Stephen Kush, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot believe he's here tonight. He's here tonight. My dog, he's here tonight. How, How you doing, buddy? Is? I'm doing all right, man. How you doing? I cannot believe. I feel younger a little bit. I feel like we're kind of... Uh, What's it? We're on some 2008, 2000. No, hold on, 2019 type shit right now. This is great. Yeah, exactly. Old school vibes. I like your hair, man. Growing it out. I see. Oh, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen you in a while. How you? You know, before we get into things, thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, how mm -hmm. you been, man? How 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 how's Stephen Cush been? Just same old, same old, man. Just kind of keeping the grind going. Scrub pythons, venomous kind of snakes. You know, that's why. Uh, tonight was one not to miss for me. You know, some of my favorite guys in the Venomous game. You know, some people I consider very close friends. And uh, this is definitely going to be a, be a good one. Can you hear me okay? Am I, am I there? It sounds like, you're in that, uh, you're, sounds like you're in that submarine pod thing. Okay, hold well, on. I shouldn't be. Do I sound better? I feel like I'm already yeah, you I, I still sound even worse? No, you sound good now. <laughs> okay, am I good? Am I back? All right. Um, Wow, why am I frozen? This is weird. I hate that we're already going into uh, technical difficulties and we just got started. Am I frozen or can you hear me? Like, can you at least hear me? I can hear you, but you're not moving. Okay, let me uh, just do this real quick. Anyways, Stephen, um, what are you looking forward to tonight? I mean, I got to say, we have some heavy hitters in the Venomous community coming to tonight's yeah. trap talk. So what are you looking forward to, to most, the most of tonight? Man, a lot. Um, you know, I, I think with these guys uh, – we have a great opportunity to hear a number of different perspectives. You know, these guys have been in the venomous game for a long time. Um, you know, Kyle has done more with the Montane rattlesnakes than almost anybody else has. Uh, you know, Alex has extensive history with arboreals, squams in particular. 
Patrick is all over the place, got a little bit of everything, really diverse collection, and just in general, years and years of experience in the industry. So I think this will be a great episode for anybody who is new to venomous keeping or is researching venomous keeping. Um, and great for anybody who has experience, has been doing it for a while and just kind of wants a really engaging conversation about the venomous hobby. And in my opinion, some of the coolest venomous snake species out there that these guys keep. All right. Well, listen, enough is enough. Hey, you might have to take over if I have issues, man, but that's fine with me. No, listen, my uh, video is going to be getting worked on right now, but enough is enough, guys. I just want to say shout out to everyone inside the uh, live chats tonight. Guys, don't forget to get the lights up right now. Also, do not forget you know, to drop a super chat if you have an important question or topic that you like to bring to tonight's uh, roundtable. But fuck it. How are you ready to go, Steven? Should we get this? Uh, Let's do it. Let's bring him in. All right, man. Enough is enough, guys. Do what you got to do to stay hydrated. Do what you got to do to get your mind right. But it's episode 355, the All-Star Venomous Roundtable coming at you right now. Let's go. Shoot! Yes. You ready to do, do more in the future? Trap yes. Talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Holy. Only trap talk, exclusive, yes, exclusive. exclusive. <laughs> oh, so stop calling us. From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, gotta love it, love it, and not I'm hot from the hop to the club to spot. Get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up. Echo, but holy shit, we're all here, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the All Star Venomous Roundtable. Holy shit, this is sick. Look at these guys. Look at these guys right here. Shout out to Kyle Vargas in the building. Bob King, what's up, buddy? How you living? I'm good, brother. How about yourself? Good, good. Are we sounding okay? I know this. It's kind of gets kind of nice when you got a lot of people going at once. But how do we sound? Everything okay? Yeah. Damn, man. Good to have you back on Trap Talk again, Kyle. How's everything going? How's the collection? Your daughter. Uh, I had some babies born today, so that's pretty good. <laughs> any uh, any crazy herping adventures lately? Um, not crazy, really, but uh, I've had quite a few this year already. Yeah. Damn, man! Listen, thanks for being a part of this. It's gonna be. We're gonna be getting into some epic ass topics regarding venomous, and I, I couldn't think of anyone else like you and all these other guys that be here. So thanks for being here tonight, Kyle. Yeah, hell yeah, man. And then we have the homie Alex in the building. Yeah. How you feeling, Alex? How's your throat, dog? You good? Oh, yeah. Good to How, are we coming in okay? Can you hear us good? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 man. How's everything going for you? How's the collection? Um, anything eventful happened lately with you and your collection lately? Um... I can right this minute. Uh, I'm, I'm in the other room, and normally I would be, you know, in my snake room with a nice backdrop, but I threw a bunch of stuff together last night. You get to be here in the kitchen, you don't get to see all the cool cases. Hey, but you know what? Sometimes kitchen has the best Wi Fi, bro, so it is what it is. I think yeah. this is great. At least you got to pop those plant behind you with it. Looks yeah. Like oh, yeah. Way. Not a window. That honestly changes the whole background game. Yeah, I think you're doing great right now. Yeah. Yeah, man. And uh, remind the people what part of Texas you're in, Alex. Uh, San Antonio area. San Antonio, man. 
Well, listen, Alex, again, thanks for being here tonight. We're going to be getting into some heavy stuff. And then uh, we have your fellow Texan right next to you, Patrick Holmes in the building. What's up, Patrick? You look a fresh What boy. up? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You look, I was, like you, I was, just, you look like you just got done teaching tennis lessons. <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> I was getting teased for this by you guys just a little while ago with my khaki shorts. Ah, okay. I, hey, look. I have you guys already know this uh, because you're in the message, but I have had two people in the last couple of days say that I need to have throat tattoos in order to fit in in this podcast. And uh, no joke, I really considered like putting a piece of tape across my neck and writing neck tattoo on there. You got to get some. Yeah. <laughs> that is wild, man. You guys are seriously eating the fuck up. That's. Steven, would you ever go there? Not quite that far, I don't think. I don't know. To be, kind of guts, man. To be fair, Steven doesn't have the body for it. What? <laughs> <laughs> no one had to say it, you know. Best yeah. friend said it like it is. I would show y'all my one, my janky ass snake tattoo, but y'all would just think I'm showing off my abs, so I'll leave it alone. Yeah, nobody wants to see your tattoo from the 90s, bro. We're good, all right? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, actually from 2001, so damn oh, near bad. the 90s. I was a lot bad. That was that one Poppin' Outcast album that was out, I think. I can't remember. But anyways, hey, listen, we're getting, know. Down, we're getting down to business, man. I, I got some really highly respectable Venomous Keepers, literally, who do things in a non, uh, I don't know, influential way. And, and I don't mean by like, you don't influence people, but you guys don't have fucking YouTube. You're not on stories. You don't do anything that's kind of uh, like clout demonish, I guess. You know, like there's a lot of things that you guys hold loyal to, and and, and I kind of want to know, and whoever wants to start first, but I kind of want to know what what the vibe is right now for anyone getting into, into the venomous game. Um, should 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 people be more concerned about keeping and admiring versus breeding if they're getting a venomous right now? Um, and, and I just want to know what how what. What breeding is looked upon right now currently in the venomous game with, with minimal experience? And whoever wants to kind of go first on that. I mean, to me, so people are like, you know, you want to breed and make more of these things. Well, if, if I make nice, healthy, strong animals available, and for one that's less that has to get out of the wild. It's still going to happen, and that is what it is. But if I, you know, make these animals and I make them bulletproof and ready for uh, you know, Joe Dipshit to jump into the game, and they're, you know, healthy, strong, they drink from water bowls, I give them all the info they need, then they don't have issues. And His, his audio is kind of going out, right? Am I tripping? Is his audio going out? No, hey, I, lo I lost it for a second, too. Yeah, hey, your audio is kind of going out there, Alex. Can you hear me? Yeah, I kind of hear you. you have like a phone case or something? I, this wasn't happening during sound check, but do you have like a phone case on or something, maybe? Yeah, yeah maybe. But I got like 9 million people. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love this live shit. Let me see. God damn it. Sorry. All right. So while he figures that out, who wants to kind of capitalize on that? Or, or, or I'll I'll, uh, I'll say something about that. Um, just for like, because I'm not an experienced venomous breeder, um, I I have a lot of mixed feelings about that stuff, and I, I keep a lot of different species of venomous snakes, and I I do plan to breed the majority of the stuff that I keep, but it's. I, I don't have any desire to like to just be pumping out a ton of venomous snakes, and I, I really enjoy breeding them, and it's uh, it's purely just a fun thing for me. And I, really, what it comes down to is that I don't like selling venomous snakes. Um, I'm just I'm just not a fan of it. I don't I don't have time to be running back and forth to the airport. I don't have time to bend to the shows. Um, I don't have time to vet customers to the degree that that, that needs to happen. Um, and so I, my interest in breeding, like it's cool if I make some money off of it or get back some of the money that 
that we put into this thing. Um, but all, the I don't I don't keep or breed anything that I don't in, really really enjoy keeping. Like none of my stuff is or none of its money projects. Nothing that I keep. I've got. I don't even know how many snakes I, and there's nothing that I keep that I breed just for the money. Um, but with the venomous stuff specifically, it's just, it's just a hundred percent that I, I enjoy keeping them and it's really cool when they do reproduce. And that's kind of where I stand on it. And I, I don't think that breeding venomous snakes is for everybody who keeps them. I just don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's something that a lot of people should aspire to do. Alex, can you hear us now? I mean, I knew you could hear yeah. us, but all right. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We're good. We're good. Did you want to finish what you were saying? Uh, I don't really remember 100%. <laughs> uh, you know. It's all good. We can yeah. hear you. We can hear you way better now, though, just so you know. Perfect. So thank you for doing that. What do you got to say on that, though, Kyle? I mean, uh, I breed, I breed a lot of stuff, man. I breed a lot of stuff every year, but um, I have a good solid friend group as well that keeps him and breeds the same species that I do, same locality that I do. Uh, so a lot of my stuff goes to them and, um, it's just, it's fun for me to be able to have stuff in, uh, different people's collections and for them to have my stuff uh, or for me to have their stuff and, uh, you know, just kind of see what projects we can come up with and send babies to each other when that time comes. And, um, it just makes it fun, man. You bounce stuff, back and forth off of each other all year, share information, new ideas. Uh, that's what I'm about. Mainly for me, this is like a learning process, man. I love learning about this shit. I don't, I don't know everything. Um, I never will, but I, I want to continue to learn as much as I can. And uh, the, the few people that I keep in my circle, I constantly learn stuff from. So that's, that's why I do it. So if, if you and I were to like meet each other and there was some trust, built between each other and you're like new and you knew I you knew I was into snakes I inquired snakes from you and then you knew I wanted to breed would you encourage me to breed or would you not encourage me to breed at a time like this yeah man definitely I would encourage you to breed for me it's the pinnacle of keeping snakes period when you come in that room and you see those babies out and you get to look at the patterns and the colors and the different markings um I mean, I sometimes sit and look at a single litter of snakes for hours. I mean, I'm talking hours, watching what they do, how they're moving, how they're interacting with each other, all that stuff. So, yeah, hell yeah, I would want somebody else to uh, experience that as well. Yeah, I want to, I agree with that. Like, to me, that's the best part of keeping snakes, it's helping create life. You know, like if you're if you're not doing it for that, what's the fucking point? You know what I mean? Like, and like Patrick said, keep what you love. I don't keep random shit just because. I keep things I love. That's why my collection is, you know, crazy exotic arboreal vipers and fucking bull snakes and rat snakes because I fucking love snakes and rat snakes and I love me too. Birds. You know, it's the stuff that I love and I want to make. And, you know, my favorite part of breeding all these snakes is keeping the best ones for myself. So I have the dopest collection of snakes. That's what I do. And it's like, it's like painting. It's like art. I take this beautiful snake and then I take this beautiful snake and I kind of hypothesize what's going to happen. And then I put them together and then they create these living pieces of art. And that one's got three scales that's fucking weird, so I'm keeping that. And that one has this funky little thing, so I'm keeping that. And just like I said, got a tight group of people that most of the animals I produce from my end and stuff never make it to general public. They go to friends and people have got a 10 point section. Trust their care. I trust their, their husband. I trust that I'm not going to get bored in two months and flip it or something or kill it. That's I'm probably not going to say shit. But like, I've a lot of 
will read push specifically. And people are like, holy shit, I just made these. Look at these. And everyone sends me pictures of their brand new babies. And they're so fun. It feels good that I contributed. You know, obviously, I just gave suggestions and they did the work themselves. But just that. Yeah. Hey, do, do me a favor, um, Alex. Try to scoot the phone up just maybe a little bit closer to you, if it's possible. Just because, <laughs> just because I, I don't know if it's the voice that's kind of getting carried back and forth, but it's like we hear you and then you cut out sometimes. But it could just be the connection. So, anyways, we'll we'll, we'll roll with it and bear with it anyway. So, I just want to see if we can make that happen. But so you heard uh, like three fourth word. Yeah, no, I, mean, I heard it. it was just, like maybe like every other third word was getting cut out, <laughs> but but I could still kind of paste. I could still paste the word together and see what you're saying. I mean, we I, I totally understood what you were saying, um, but you know, I just think uh, you know like what Alex just said about kind of verifying that somebody has the proper husbandry is like that's ideal for. I mean, I mean like what's behind me, right? I mean, I, I, if I ever do get to the point where I'm producing the shit behind me, I can't ever imagine selling it. But goddamn, I would like to talk to someone like Patrick or Steven and be like, yo, I know you got something that I want. And that's how I would like that to happen. Right. But God forbid, you know, I get cracking with these and I do have to sell one. Um, I can't keep, keep really tabs with everybody. Like I can't really like, like, you know, if I push it on morph market, I don't, I can't really be like, you know, fuck, I, you know, I, at the end of the day, it's like, I need to sell that snake. Um, so I'm just wondering like if somebody knew were to come into venomous and they do get to the point where they're breeding, and they do have to branch out and sell um, like that. That's kind of where you, you know, we would want to have to like coach that person you would think, or like, I'm just saying like, as easy it is for a snake to get to somebody responsible to somebody irresponsible. I feel like it's very easy if it comes to somebody having it available and then just putting it up somewhere for sale or something. I don't know. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, I'm like I, mean, I usually expect Patrick to be the first one to speak over everything, but it's no big deal, I guess. He's so I, I have I have things to say about all, all of this stuff. I'm just kind of sitting back and listening. Um, Patrick, speak up, when you're good. <laughs> when I when I say that I don't have time to um, vet customers and make for venomous, uh, it's because I already have I do so much of that with the green trees, man. I spend so much of my time helping people out with their own stuff and and with ones that i'm selling them or ones that i've already sold it, that like that just it takes up a lot of time um to make sure that it's again it's not just about the animals that i'm selling i spend a good part of every day helping people just answering questions about green trees and i just don't have time to add the venomous stuff to it which is why i don't have much of an interest in selling venomous snakes um that being said what Kyle and Alex both said about breeding, it, it is, it's the fucking pinnacle. There is nothing cooler in, in all of keeping snakes. There's nothing cooler than coming in and seeing new babies. Um, it, it's, I hatched out my first snake eggs in 95 and it never, ever, ever gets fucking old, man. It, um, just today, I had my laptop pulled up at work and I was going through pictures that I took of my last Beyond clutch. I've had like, I, I don't even know how many Chondro clutches. I think that's like my eighth or ninth clutch of Beox that I've hatched out. And I was giggling like a little kid, just looking at the pictures of them hatching out from a couple of weeks ago. You know, it, it just still, it's just always the coolest thing. Um, uh, the, the little wagglers vipers that I had born at the shop. I didn't even breed those. I was just from grabbing imports, but it's super dope to see those babies. And then I just, for the first time a couple weeks ago, I actually produced a viper species. There's, you know, I've been keeping vipers for like 27 years, but I never tried to breed them until real recently and, and finally had some success with it. And it was fucking amazing, dude. Um, I just, uh, my, my goal with moving venomous snakes that I produce um, 
Patrick, Patrick, yeah. man, how, many, how many of those venomous did you produce? The ones that you did, the vipers? How many of those? Oh, there, there, were, there was only five babies, which is crazy because pup adders usually have like nine million fucking babies. She had a bunch of slugs too. I can't remember how many. There's a, a, a whole bunch of slugs and then just five, uh, five babies. And, and, um, and, and those, five, those five are doing well. You established those. And oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, you have them still? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, yeah, they're still here. Um, uh, I was messaging Alex and, and a little little chat group that we have um, the first night that I was trying to feed them. And I, they four out of five of them ate off the tongs the first night. They all ate the first time I tried to feed them. They're, they're doing great. Um, but it, it was uh, – it was really cool when I found them in there because when I came in and saw there, I had been gone for a day and they were born probably the, the day before I found them. And I saw slugs in there and then I saw a stillborn in there. And I just, that's what she did for me the first time I got all slugs and stills. And so I assume that's what happened again. And I opened up the cage and I just had this feeling to be real careful when I was digging around in there and I I moved the water bowl, and there was a baby under the water bowl, and I was just like, oh fuck! And uh, they were all just hiding in there. Man, I had to had to dig them all out. And they're 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 badass, man. I love puff adders. It's a cool cool species, and the adults that I have, I, I think they're the most beautiful pair of puff adders that I've ever seen. Um, so you're, you're just keep all five, or what's your game plan with the five? No, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna let a, a pair of them go and keep a trio. It's the it's two point three. And one of the females is really, really runty. Like she's half the size of the other ones. Um, so I'm going to keep her and another pair. And then I'll let a pair of them go, which takes me back to what I was saying about moving these animals. Um, I either, everything that I, that I'm breeding, they're either things that I will move the way that Kyle and Alex were just talking about. Um, just between friends, we send out messages. We, we, keep each other updated on these these projects that we have and when the time comes i already know who's going to want them all that there's certain stuff that i keep um that are just rare enough that if they produce for me i will i'll never have to like post them for sale or anything like that they'll just go to the homies right but anything else like if this puff adder next time I breed her, if she drops 68 babies or whatever, or, or I'm going to be putting my gaboons together this year. Some of these species that are more common that I, I just keep because I love them and I will occasionally throw them together to see if they'll breed. Uh, that's the type of stuff that um, they'll just go to Alex so he can do what he does with them. <laughs> so um, because, uh Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's, um, you know, he, he does it, uh, that's his full-time thing, you know, and uh, I have, I've got a full-time job, and the chondros are full-time, and all that other stuff, so, you know, that's, everything that we let go will be one way or the other, it's either going to the homies, going out in trades, or it's gonna, it's gonna go to Alex, or guys like Alex, if he's not interested, um, who will throw them on the table, or, you know, have a bigger network, or whatever. I just don't have uh, I don't have the time or the desire to mess with it directly. So, Patrick, I have to stop you right now. Pause real quick because you, you don't have a lot of time. You're a busy guy. Like, for, ever since I've known you, you are nonstop working. And if I do get to talk to you, it's because it's on your lunch break or something, and you're just being really nice. Um, <laughs> I live on lunch but, break. But let's just say the most craziest shit you keep hot-wise, right? What's the worst damage it could do to you if it bites you? Oh man, well that's that's a uh, like turn out of the conversation. No, I'm so no, I, I have no, hold on, hold on. Where I'm getting with that is yeah. because, like, it, obviously, God forbid, right? Like, I don't want that. Yeah. You, you rely on work. You rely on working that nine to five, right? But if you yeah, get, if you get bit, it changes everything. Um, so I, I feel like it's like, and I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of being a Karen right now, but I'm just saying you don't really have time to get bit. Right. And I know you're working no. off not to get bit, but what makes you want to just take that risk? I'm just curious. So there's, um, the, the, there's a few things I can say about that. First of all, to answer the first question, I have, I've got like, I don't know, 20 different species of vipers or something like that. There are three pairs of snakes that I have that, that are that kind of freaked me out. Um, 
the the um, Bothericus. No, I'm sorry. The Bothrops by Lineatus are fucking hot as shit. They are really, really venomous. But they're little bitty things, and they're kind of unassuming. And and so that in and of itself makes me be really careful around them because I try to just run through them like I do everything else. But man, those guys, they're, they've got reach and they're really, really toxic. Um, but fortunately at, at the size they are, they're going to be low, low yield. Then I have the, the Zabcan rattlers. The Zabcans are the most dangerous snakes that I have. No question. Um, the male wants me dead all the time. Um, and uh, I mean, he legit makes an attempt on my life every opportunity he gets. He's a, just a big, a big nasty of, rattlesnake. A lot of stuff you have is like trios or like pairs at least, right? I'm yeah, that. yeah. That's mo most of what I – the only species that I have large numbers of are squams and, and eyelash vipers. I've got about 50 squams and 20-something and eyelash vipers. And then, of course, I've got, you know, the um, – with if you include the baby wagglers, I got a good handful of wagglers because I just had – those females drop babies, but um, most of the stuff is pairs and trios. And the, the other pair of snakes that's that's scary to me are the Mangshan Vipers. Um, you know, those the Zabcan Rattlers are arguably the most toxic rattlesnake and one of the biggest. The Mangshans, there's no anti-venom. They have crazy fangs and they're, they are sneaky and they have reach and they're just dangerous. So basically what it boils down to is the safe way to do it is to treat everything like they're that toxic. Yeah. If you just treat everything like it's that toxic, you'll be in better shape. I'd be lying if I said I don't do shit that's, uh, you know, if I said that I'm just perfect with all of my techniques every single time, that's, that's not true. Um, but I do try to be very careful. I've been doing this for a really, really long time. And, and knock on wood, I have never taken a bad envenomation from anything. And, uh, other and than, so, other than the venomous lizard. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, snakes. Other than the, the, the Gila monster was fucked up. But, um, epic story, though. That was an epic story, just so you know. It is, it's a fun story. Um, but yeah, I never, never had a bad bite from a venomous snake. I've never even had, I've had a couple of close calls and stuff like that. Um, but the, you're right in that getting, getting bit by something nasty, uh, could, could change my whole life or even kill me. Um, and yes, it's a risk, but man, if you just do the things that you're supposed to do, you really minimize the risk. And, and the, the risk that guys like us have is more in the volume of animals that we're dealing with because you, it's mathematical probability. When you have this many animals and you interact with them um, the way, the way that I, that we do, it just increases the probability of mistakes being made. Um, and, and that is actually going to lead into something that, um, we don't have to get onto the subject now, but something I want to talk about in this conversation is about, I'm, I'm trying to lean towards keeping more, more or all of my adults, the way that Alex and Kyle do, where I can minimize the interaction that I have to have with them because they're well, and Steven keeps a lot of his stuff this way too. Oh. Um, I, I want them in naturalistic or and or bioactive enclosures so that they don't require much maintenance and I can and the cages look pretty. It's pleasing to me, but also I can just leave them the fuck alone and let them be snakes and uh, and and you know and minimize interaction, which is beneficial for them and definitely beneficial for me. Um, you know, people ask me a lot why I keep venomous snakes, and I always use the analogy that it's just like keeping fish. Nobody is like Netflix and chilling with their fucking with their tang and their lionfish on the couch or whatever, you know. It's like just something. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's something pretty to look at, man. And uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm in the way that people keep nice planted fish tanks. I'm trying to have um, most or all of my vi my adult vipers set up that way, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about this conversation because I want to get into that. Um, with all of these guys because that's how that's how they do it and it's something that i'm interested in now kyle i gotta ask you like what when would what because you've been doing this for how many years now kyle as far as keeping venomous uh how long have you been breeding for 19 jesus okay so when did you realize that this was the move to have them in a more naturalistic setup where you don't have to touch them much or have to use a hook a lot of times like what when did you kind of make that transition 
I would say probably about 14 years, about five years in. So about 14 years ago. And, the, and, and you, you notice benefit, like it benefiting a lot by doing that, like right off the bat or like that. Yeah. I mean, almost instantly, um, things are, I mean, they, they do better. They, they breed better. They acclimate to captivity faster because I do collect some of my own wild caught stock. Um, you know, for example, I use in the past, I would catch snakes and, um, it would take them sometimes four to six years to acclimate cycle and breed. Um, and now, I mean, I can do it in about a year's time. So the acclimation are, process. Are, are, I'm sorry. Are, are there signs you look for that gives you the green light to go ahead and breed them or like, like how, how what determines what could take a year to six years? I'm just curious. I mean, they just, they just wouldn't do it prior. They wouldn't breed. I mean, it quite literally would not go for me uh, until I started changing things up and doing more natural setups and, um, you know, not fucking with them as much, giving them a lot of hides in the cages and different ambient temperatures throughout the cage and, you know, all, all that stuff that they're getting outside. Yeah. And, and Kush, um, obviously you've, I mean, last time I checked, your guys' whole room transitioned into a, a realistic room for, for full of these montane rattlesnakes that have low temperatures, but obviously climb all over the branches and, and, and really live life within these enclosures that you built them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the way that I do this uh, with the montane rattlesnakes is, you know, based right off of Kyle's setup. Um, I am in a pretty fortunate position to where I didn't get into venomous snakes. He's like you know, keeping them myself until I was you know, more than 10 years into keeping reptiles. So I was able to make a lot of my mistakes with non-venomous, with, you know, hardier snakes, with stuff like that. So then when I finally decided to take the dive, I could do everything right from the start. Um, that's kind of what, you know, I would hope that anybody who's listening to this, who's either brand new to venomous or thinking about getting into it, can take away is, you know, this is collectively 50 years plus of mistakes more or less, uh, all of us, and you guys yeah. a lot more than me. Um, and this is kind of the culmination of all of that. So if this can be a starting point for somebody else who can avoid making a bunch of mistakes with their animals, and mistakes will still happen. Um, this is, you know, that's the best part about kind of getting all this information out there is so that uh, next generation is better set up than the than the last one was. But, but anyway, I guess to circle back, yeah, everything's naturalistic. Um, and, you know, that's always evolving as well. Um, you know, one thing that I don't do that, you know, like Kyle, for instance, will do is have, you know, rocks and dirt and grasses and whatnot in the enclosures from the actual ranges where the snakes come from, which with the montane rattlesnakes, you know, we're lucky in the United States and especially Kyle where he is to where that's actually a feasible thing. You know, I... I for me to deck out a scrub python cage with branches and dirt from, from Papua New Guinea would be kind of difficult. Um, but uh, that's, you know, for me, stepping my game up looks like doing more stuff like that. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for the most part, with the species of hots that you guys keep, they don't need big water dishes, correct? Like, they don't, like, because I remember seeing your room, Stephen, um, where, like, the, they, they just had really small deli cups of water. Yeah, I mean, I, with like the rattlesnakes in particular, I don't keep them with particularly large water bowls. I just make sure that they're always full. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and that always is obviously very species dependent. You know, some will need a lot more water than others. Some will like to submerge themselves. But, you know, with the montane rattlesnakes, where, where they're coming from, at least where we're seeing it, they're rarely going to run into standing water. Um, so, you know, I, I think as long as they have that ability to drink, and it's the way that I'm seeing it so far. They don't need an excessive amount of water in that enclosure. Yeah. So who who here? I mean, Alex. Let me ask you this: with all the venomous you keep, species wise, does it range temps as far as like what what's preferred with the with the <laughs> most species that you keep, or is it majority the same? So Kyle will agree and can attest to it. Like, if you're gonna keep different species from different biotypes like you can't have you know 
cold weather montanes in the same room as hot desert or tropical like you have to have your rooms designated for the you know um, climate in the area so he has a cold room and a hot room mm -hmm. so with my room i have i don't know probably 15 15 or 16 different species in my arboreal room and they're from different parts of the world but they're all from about the same climate the same kind of uh weather patterns so i have a baseline temperature in my room of 79 and then if i want the snakes to be a little cooler and have a lower high end on my lowest shelf closer to the floor it's just a couple inches off the floor and that gives everyone the you know floor of the enclosure 78 degrees and then they get up top of it if i want them to be a little warmer you know do waste or a little bit like check tie the second and third shelf so, and some the eye action things like that throw out setups that are just running off ambient temperature of the room and snake i'll put them higher in the room so that way they have you know 80 to one and everybody you know works well uh, where i'm at and with my room my arboreal room stays 55 percent empty humidity pretty steady you know when i go through and water plants and change waters they jump Top no issues, you know. Um, that's why, like, there's people will be like, "Oh man, why aren't you messing with Ceratophora or some of these Bothriacus or you know things like that?" And it's because they like cooler temperatures than what my room ever gonna be, so I would be doing them a disservice by keeping them. Yeah, I could keep them alive, and they. Would Eat and shit and shed, but they're never going to be truly comfortable. They're never going to consistently like they if they were in a room that was 74 degrees. You know, it's so so I I have learned these things over years of keeping that that kept not rid of stuff, but over the last almost 10 years of focusing. I, Dream. This is what I want to do. I, I love all snakes. You can't shoot me a snake that I'm not like. That's a fucking cool snake. That's pretty. Right. But I don't want. To, it doesn't make me give me joy, or, or I don't want to invest my time. Real stuff, practical, and these places. And so I focus on. That. And if it doesn't fit into my style of keeping. And my colubrid room runs the same runs the same 79 temp and works well for all my colubrids and then when they need to get cold I throw them in the garage and it works well. and, yeah I've, yeah so you know Kyle you know you have different rooms obviously too I know you said that before right is it is it mainly babies have their own room is that what it is or how's your room split up I, f I forget Oh, uh, no, I got my bigger room is for the rattlesnakes, all my Montana rattlesnakes and uh, my copperheads. And then my other room is a warm room for all my stuff from South Africa and Namibia. And then a lot of the stuff that you would get natively from, from where you're from would be in what room? The, the warmer room, I would, I would assume? Cold. Oh, colder. Holy shit. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because they're all from high elevation where he's at. Steven, when you went to go camp in Herp with, with Kyle, was it did it get cold at night when you were there? Yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah. remember. I could have sworn you went during summertime, but it still gets cold oh, during summer. Summer ain't a thing in those mountains, my guy, especially at night. No way. Yeah. 
the, the first <laughs> night out, out in the mountains, the, the first trip I was there. Um, yeah, Kyle already knows where I'm going with this. <laughs> I, I'm, I've camped a handful of times, but I'm a city kid. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm still I'm getting done out there, but I'm, I'm very much a rookie. Um, you know, they're explaining the, the hammocks with the, the under quilt for the insulation and that, yada, yada. And somehow I didn't catch that. If you have the, uh, the under quilt, you still want a sleeping bag. I didn't go for the sleeping bag on the first night. And I have never been so cold at night in my entire life. I had multiple winter coats on and I was just shivering my ass <laughs> off. And the next day they were like, how'd you sleep? I'm like, my God, that was the coldest night of my life. They're like, did you have a sleeping bag? I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> it, was, it was next to his hammock, by the way. I said it there. I'm not, I'm not saying that it was anyone's fault but myself. But, uh, but, just, uh, but it's crazy. Steven, it's even rather there and fucking just chill to death rather than look stupid and get up and act like he needed it. Probably. <laughs> I used by like no, I got to stay. Did not even cross my mind until the next morning. It didn't even cross my fucking mind. Um, but that was a, that was a good learning experience for a couple of reasons. But from a snake keeping perspective, you know, I keep these snakes that we're we're going to hurt for, particularly uh, clobber eye and uh, blacktails. And you know, you don't think of snakes, especially when you're new to this, as animals that are coming from that climate. And we were we were camped. At a lower elevation, you're finding the snakes too at times. So where they're, you know, even higher up, it might be even colder than we are. Obviously, they're they're gonna get hunkered down to, into their spots. But you know, 40, 40 something degrees is still forty something degrees, and uh, that yeah. kind of puts everything in perspective to when it comes to keeping these snakes in captivity. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think people um, real, realize what it's like uh, in. In the desert, when people think about the the at elevation, you've got uh, it gets cold as shit at night, but at the same time, rocks will retain heat. There, it seems like it's dry and in the desert, but rocks will retain moisture. And people just don't have a, a a good understanding of what a lot of these climates are really like, man. I, I, over the years, I think a lot of people have geared towards keeping mo like people who know what they're doing here towards keeping a lot of stuff way cooler than we used to. When I got into keeping stuff in, in pet stores in the, in the 90s, it was like give everything a hot rock or a heat lamp with a 90 degree basking spot. You know what I'm saying? It was like every reptile was kept that way. And now we know that the vast majority of reptiles should not be kept that way. And uh, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a trip what it's like being – I haven't done a ton of time in the mountains, but I went to New Mexico when I was a kid. And I remember in the same day looking at, at the desert and white sands. And then the same day being up in the mountains in Cloudcroft and, and the drastic difference. But even um, in, in Big Bend in Texas, I have in, the, in one day been up in the Chisos Mountains. And then a, a couple hours later, been down in the, in the, um, the St. Helena Canyon. And it's like during the day, a 30 degree difference um, from, you know, it was like 106 degrees on the Rio Grande down in the canyon and, and nice and cool up in the Chisos during the day. So it's the, the it's, it's always funny to me when people look at a region where a snake is from and, and then like Google some shit about the weather and assume that they know what that animal really experiences because it's really, really funny with the pythons from Indonesia when Indonesia is 13,000 fucking islands. And just there's you can take one small chunk of West Papua and find a crazy variation in climates just in, in a very small piece of one island, you know. So um, anyways, uh, well, I mean, we're talking a lot about the ambient temperatures, but I think also what a lot of people don't realize or take into account is that just about anywhere you go in the world where snakes live, if you get down far enough beneath the surface, it's going to maintain a pretty constant temperature of 55 yeah. to 60 degrees. At, you know what I'm saying? So you got to understand that when these snakes are out basking in the morning and reaching temperatures of 90, 95 degrees, you know, the species I keep anyways, um, they can at any point in time go down low enough in the rocks or, or the holes that they're living in 
and be at 55 to 60 degrees down there. No problem. So there's a lot of temperature fluctuation as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Even, with the, even with the stuff that you guys keep, how often do you guys see your stuff basking longer than a couple minutes? Like, I mean, do you, do you have stuff that you see on the regular that's just chilling out there for a long time? Or is it usually just passing through, basking, and then goes away? Like, how, what, what are you guys experiencing? It, it ranges for me from species to species. But, um, yeah, I mean, generally, especially my females, they, they're out basking all day every day that i have the lights on um yeah. some Especially of them do come out babies. for a couple hours but m the majority of them they're out basking same with you alex yeah uh most of the arboreal species um the females kind of stay away from any warm light unless they're cooking offspring and uh, i it, unless it's a snake that has bred, um, they just have an overhead fluorescent, which raises the top, you know, with the baseline 79 already, the floor of the enclosure is 78, you know. So if they're not a basking gravid female, they just have the overhead fluorescent, which gets the top around 82, 83. So, you know, some of them, um, them kind of have their spot it's up a little higher and then like every snake is different even within the same species that's one of the things i really like about having big groups of certain species and what's helped me to learn about having a lot of them and seeing all the different behaviors and no two snakes have the same uh, behavior i have some I have some that never touch the ground I have some that never, you know, leave the ground. I have some that in the morning they're in this spot, in midday they're in this spot. You know, in the night they're over in the corner, and they all have manner. Uh, you know, and then, like for the, the Asian species, when other females are grabbed, they don't really sit directly on sight. Look, sometimes, uh, like my Gemenius does, will pull back up a little light. A lot of them will like the Jason basket, you could say. So they're like, shining down right here. They'll sit kind of in the edge. They get a little bit of like, you know, sticky, kind of radiating, cooking a foil, and then they'll move and adjust. But they don't sit to really up to the focus of the light. Sitting directly under the light, but then down on the floor. You know, the floor is in that spot, they're at 85, and then, you know, they'll move up to the light and move up to 88. This kind of carries the swans whenever, whenever they have it, they sit in the roast from lights on to lights off at 88, 92 degrees and not move, other than moving up to the circle to fully cook and adjust. Whenever the arboreal species aren't gravid, they don't really like that. But like you, you mentioned, in the wild, these snakes, you know, have a little home range that they live in. And uh, Kyle, well, you can agree with it. You know, they might move two feet, hit a little sunshine for 15 minutes, and then move two feet down to a little cooled off spot, you know, and then move back out and move around. And so we, we can't create perfect conditions in the box. Like, it's right. never going to be as good as the side of a mountain or a tree branch in the rainforest. We do our best and we give them everything that we have seen or researched or read. And, you know, we know that we're hitting those marks by them being comfortable and reproducing and growing and not having issues. You know, that's our indicator. But we can never truly do it as good as the wild, naturally, you know. Uh, do, do you guys think that you could keep these? I'm not saying it's preferred, obviously, but do you think there's people out there 
keeping similar species of you guys in rack systems and getting away with it? Yeah, so so. What do you think, Patrick? I mean, I, I'm a fucking. I mean, look behind me. I'm a tub warrior. You you are uh, right right now, literally directly behind me. I've got. I think I have like a dozen or more species of arboreal vipers in in the room with me right now. That being said, um, all, all of them are almost all of them are um, juveniles and and uh, you know babies, juvenile sub adults. There's there's a couple of adults. Um, but the difference between being able to keep them alive in tubs and even have them thriving as far as their health um, does not necessarily mean that they'll actively reproduce in those setups. Um, I have a bunch of squams and I have a bunch of them in tubs and they do just fine in tubs. You can keep a squam in a tub set up like a corn snake and it'll stay alive just fine. But um, I, I don't think uh, I don't think that anybody is is consistently breeding arboreal vipers in tubs um but it's not it's not just the tub it's it's the the dynamics the container does not matter at all like it's it's not about the container it's what you have inside of it so if i had uh extra large cambro tubs that had a you know where that i was able to rig up a basking site and have some branches and plants in there they'll breed just fine like that it doesn't have to be an exoterra look at what the zoos do with 10 gallon aquariums you know, look at what, what Kyle does with 10 gallon aquariums. Um, it, it's not about the container, it's about how it's set up. <laughs> hey, He's that's not, not uh, that's, his, that again. <laughs> that's his, that's, hey, that's his new setup. That's all, that's all the new shit over there. <laughs> all right, all right. Why, why you gotta bring up old shit though, Patrick? Come on, man. Uh, hey, look, hold on. Living I, in the I past, have, man. Yeah. I've got, I, all of my specs and lefts are in 10 gallon aquariums. <laughs> um so uh but again it's not about the container it's how it's set up and you can set up tubs and i'm actually kind of leaning towards that i've been playing with some of that a little bit with what i can get away with in tubs um and trying different different perch configurations and go semi-naturalistic setups and stuff like that there's I'm, I'm always changing something or experimenting with something but like i mentioned before i i was excited to come on here because i i want to um Alex and I, I think, are on, on, on the same page with this. It's, it seems like the easiest way to do this in volume is to raise everything in very simple setups. You know, we keep all of our babies. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I actually don't know a whole lot about how Kyle raises his babies. But Alex and I, we keep all of our babies in simple tub setups. And then when they're big enough to start looking at, uh, at you know, acting like adults, then, uh, then we can move them into other stuff. And I, I've got tons of stuff that's in, you know, I've got Neotache cages, Vision cages, PVC cages, Exoterras. I've got a whole, a whole crazy mix match of stuff over here. Um, and uh, I'm trying to lean toward the either bioactive or naturalistic setups um, from, from my adult vipers. And some of that's going to be tough. So I'm going to have XL Cambro racks for some of the small arboreal species. And I'm going to do exoterras and 10 gallons and, and whatever seems to work, but I just don't have it all. I don't have it all figured out yet. The, I want it to look nice, but the real purpose is for it to be less maintenance for me and less interaction and stress on the snakes so that they'll, they'll be happy and reproduce. I've read swans and tubs a few years ago just to see if I fucking could do it. But, yeah. Yeah. I bring this I bring this up because you know, as you guys know, um ball pythons do really great in tubs or rack systems, right? You know, from, from what I from what I could experience. Uh but now like there's in the UK there's like this research being done about ball pythons' brains gener generationally shrinking because they're being raised in a tub and they're not getting, you know, the sunlight on air or getting the natural ability to climb trees. And and year after year after year of year of not getting that, it's making their brains smaller and smaller and smaller. What do you guys have to say to that? Uh, no, I'm with it. I uh, I like racks for babies and juveniles, and then things go in cages. Even my colubrids, I could fit a fuck ton more bull snakes and rat snakes in my room if I just crammed them all in a rack. But I don't want to do that. I want to see them. I like seeing the snakes. 
the juveniles are in racks, but once they go get older, my adults are all in vision cages, and you know it keeps. It also helps me to not, you know, be dumb and get too much where I can't maintain. Right. I I see people post these rooms of nothing but gray. There's this one. I don't know. I'm sure y'all fucking know who he is. It's just gray room. That's a beautiful jailhouse gray and all gray uniform racks. And it looks like a fucking spare parts room in the back of an auto zone. And people see it and they're just like, that looks so fucking sweet. That's so dope. Hey, man, Freedom Breeder, bro. Shout out to the sponsor. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to, each their own, to each their own. Y'all do it and do the most and crank it out and make tons of money and have dope shit. That's cool. Just not for me. I don't like that. To me, that's fucking silly. I like pretty things, and I like to see my shit. And, you know, when I worked at the zoo, we had a fucking ball python on, on display. And he put in the other shade with, you know, real substrate and sticks and logs. And the weirdest thing, that motherfucker shed a whole piece every time, ate off tweezers, moved around. It was crazy, at, at, you know. It, it was super wild. So, you know. Must have been uh, an import. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you trying yeah. to say that ball pythons will act like snakes if you let them act like snakes? I don't know. It, 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 it was weird to me, too. But, <laughs> you know, everyone keeps different. Uh, racks have their purpose, but to me, not full life. In the I also I also think, gentlemen, that you know, given the given the, the, the tenure on how long someone's been in the game, a lot, of, a lot of dots start to connect. I mean, I'm I'll never forget when I went last time I was at Steven and and and, and at their facility, I, he was telling me how he was getting rid of majority of his ball pythons, if not all of them. And I was like, What? I was like, I thought he was fucking insane. Like I was like, that doesn't make any sense. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And he and and, and, and mind you, he I don't know how, how many how many ball pythons do you have now? I'm just curious. That was that was about over a year ago. So. Too many. Still. You still have more? Okay, never mind. But anyways, like I just couldn't understand that analogy. Like why? Like that's what this is what brought us in, you know. And now we're in a place where there's people terrified about having snakes they can't sell. They're cutting them in half. Like they, it's kind of looks ridiculous. Like fifty percent off, and it's like almost like whoa. Like, what is this? like Kmart. Like I just, that's not why I want to breed. Just fucking be in a panic and slash to get rid of them. But the, 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 the truth of the matter is, is when you have so much overhead and when you're sitting on so much, you got to get rid of that shit. And, and I was like, I don't want that. Then if that's the case, like I don't want to fucking have thirty goddamn ball python. Actually, I only don't even want to have ten. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. I, I feel like I'm graduating too and understanding the whole. But listen, I, I got a, I got a wall full of these tool racks, okay, buddy. So uh, I have one wall that looks like AutoZone. That's it. The rest is great. <laughs> but I don't know, man. Ah, dude. Yeah, man. This is like I got an AutoZone wall too. It's right. too great, but it's there. I get it. But my tubs are clear, so I can see them. Yeah. Well, I I, I forgot. You worked at a zoo, and I don't think I asked you that on the podcast where we even talked about that. But how long, how many years were you there for, Alex? Uh, I was there for two years. And, and, and you worked primar primarily with reptiles? Oh, yeah. There? I mean, well, I learned and lended a hand with all kinds of other stuff. But it, I went there to do the reptiles and run the department and do all that. And, uh, yeah, it was cool. Well, I mean, and it, it, the this I mean, it used to be called the Snake Farm, and it was primarily a reptile zoo. Now, Eric um, has has expanded it to a, a lot more than what it was. But you yeah. know that that he turned it into a legit zoo. It used to just be a roadside attraction. I, I've been going there since like 1990 or something like that. And uh, they, I mean, it's it's still a really really reptile heavy exhibit down there. Um, it's just way cooler than it used to be. Yeah, it's nicer than when I was there. It was great. That's where I, that's where I got bit by the Gila monster. Is that great, great, great Patrick? Great, great. <laughs> and no, no. Listen, so I, I got to say, the biggest assist I, I was hoping Kush will come through for tonight is him just kind of 
having some stuff to relate to with his own experience keeping um, these species of venomous snakes. Now, Stephen, how far deep are you into breeding at this point, or, or where are we at with you and your you and the collection and, and, and breeding? So last year was the first year of pairing anything up. So now we got a handful of gravid females over here that you know over the next couple of months should be dropping their litters and uh, quite excited about it. Um, but actually, I think that leads into a question that I have for the the round table. I'll, I'll start with Kyle. Um, you know, this is my first year I'm gonna have some litters of of you know these montane rattlesnakes and uh, hopefully a, a viper litter too. You know, for, for anyone who's listening or watching that, you know, doesn't have experience with these snakes, these babies come out so much smaller than you could even imagine. Uh, you look at them and you don't even think that a, a day old pinky could fit inside that snake. Uh, but as these three guys are proof of that, obviously it does happen, but it can be quite difficult. So, uh, Kyle, what are, what are some techniques and whatnot that you've developed over time for uh, feeding babies, I guess, you know, rattlesnakes, rattlesnakes, this, anything really, but, you know, kind of take that and. I mean, not really any techniques uh, per se, but I just give them what they want to eat, man. And the truth is that these snakes in the habitat they live in, uh, they eat a lot of lizards. And so when they come out, if they don't want to eat pinky mice, um, I just give them a lizard and they eat. Um, it's not really, I mean, you know, sometimes if I want to get them switched over to a pinky or, or bury up their diet a little bit, I'll, I will scent, or I've even cut like the skin off a lizard and put it on a pinky's face and, uh, you know, get them to eat that way, but not really any, uh, any tricks, man. You just give them what they want to eat. Hmm. Anything about setups or whatnot that you found over time either help or hurt feeding when they're first born or really is just getting them that item that they, that they want? Nah, so for me, um, I used to have some issues getting stuff to eat, especially when I was keeping babies on like paper towels, uh, just kind of bare little tub type cages. Um, because essentially, you know, again, over time, I, I learned that for whatever reason, Montane rattlesnakes, I don't know that other snakes are like this, but specifically with what I work with, um, you know, they're born in their cages that the adults are in. And they have, you know, like you said earlier, I have the grasses, the leaf litter, the dirt, the branches, the rocks, everything from their native home range. So um, they're born on that kind of stuff. And then I leave them in with the, the mom for about a month, a month and a half. And then I take them out and I throw them on this paper towel and a whole bunch of new smells that they're not used to, um, new environment that they just have no idea what they've been thrown into. And a lot of times they get stressed out and won't eat. So uh, you take a baby who's born in a naturalistic enclosure and you put it in something that's similar to what you just took it from and it for me, they do a lot better. Um, I oftentimes even take some of the leaf litter and grasses and put it in the baby cages to kind of, you know, let them familiarize themselves with it and not, not get so shocked uh, at a new environment. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, have you ever tried feeding the babies in the enclosure with the mom? I was going to ask that the same thing. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Yeah, I do it regularly, man. I've got a lot of videos, actually, uh, that I've taken over the years. And... I, I mentioned this a little bit in the last uh, the last podcast that me and MJ did, but um, the, the the moms almost, in a sense, kind of show the babies how to eat. Um, I've, I'll feed the mothers with the baby in the with the babies in the cage, and uh, as the mother is eating, you can see the babies kind of coming up and rubbing against her face, rubbing against the prey item. And kind of using like some scent recognition uh, to familiarize themselves with, hey, this is this is food right here. And I'm not saying that it always happens like that, um, but in in my cages here in my room, I have found that that really really helps familiarize the babies with what food is. Hmm. That's fucking amazing. That's gonna be so cool to see that. Yeah, I got a lot of videos of it, man. I'll I'll shoot some over your way. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. At what point did you try that? Kyle, like, when did you say fucking any? Let me see if this works. 
I've been doing that for like ten, eight or ten years now, I guess. Wow. Are you still keeping the babies in the critter keeper style cages? Uh, so I actually have some custom cages being made right now that will be literal miniature, uh, like what I have behind me. They'll be just little miniature version versions of what Bad the adults ass. are in. They'll have Bad all ass. their own basking and everything. All the babies will. So individually, that's awesome. Yeah. Wow. And, and and what's your what overall right now, Kyle? Like how many babies would you say you're producing a year ballpark? Shit, man. Uh, I guess anywhere from like a hundred to a hundred and fifty. My tripping is that a lot? <laughs> it's a lot of Montana rattlesnakes. <laughs> That's right. And your your game is the holdback game. You're obviously making shit that you want to keep. That's the whole point of what you're doing, right? For the most part. A lot, a lot of it, yeah, man. Um, I I do. I I always from every single litter, I typically keep at least. Uh, a single animal or a pair from every litter. Um, and yeah, you know, I try to breed for the, the kind of look like Alex was saying earlier about, you know, picking this squam and this squam and putting them together. I mean, it's the same shit I do with the clubs. You know, you see these little band, these different bands, or you want to make a snake that looks like this one with the color of this one. And um, yeah, you, you put that together, man. And sometimes when they pop out, it's like, oh, all right, well, I, I don't really need any more snakes, but I got to keep that one and that one and that one and <laughs> yes. this one. So yeah. Yeah. every it's, time, every fucking time. Steven, yeah. If, if Steve, if, if everything goes your guys' way, Steven, I mean, what's your guys' game plan with a lot of the stuff that you produce? Uh, I mean, really same thing. Um, I think a lot of it will be, you know, picking that, that hold back or two from each litter, um, you know, finding the one that kind of, you know, Take the, take the litter, compare it to the, the adults in the collection, you know, pick one or two that would complement them well or stand out above the rest. And then, uh, same deal, like, you know, whether it's Kyle or, or any anybody else who uh, has a collection of these already, you know, see if there's an opportunity to exchange bloodlines or to complete a pair somewhere, um, stuff like that. So, that, uh, but then, obviously, if you know, anything extra, I definitely intend on on selling stuff. And uh, you know, the guys I'm looking up to as far as how to carry themselves within the market. And stuff. Are you a little, little worried though? Like, let's just say you have all these babies to establish. I mean, you, you a little bit of a uh, like butterflies on that one, or? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've raised some at this point from very small. Um, hardly any from unestablished though so uh, you know i have good guidance so I, i'm not too too overly worried i'm curious you know patrick especially because you know with chondros man god damn do you know um what's it like this this whole all of this right here these are all fucking new baby chondros in in this whole <laughs> over here I know all about the tricky feeding babies man so I, I, and I get butterflies every time too just like CBUs. that's something that never goes away I'm always nervous about it I can get fucking anything to eat I've got fucking thousands of hours of experience getting finicky snakes to eat and every single time that I produce something new or get something new or hatch a new clutch of chondros I'm like fuck here we go again so what do, you like to, what do you like to do then, Patrick, going into something you know that's finicky? Oh, man, I, my, my, my toolbox is crazy. I've got so many different tricks. Right now with the baby Waggler's Vipers, um, what I decided to do is I, I've, I've seen a lot of people get in baby Waggler's um, that seem to do okay for a short period of time or even a few months and then just kind of randomly roll. And, um, and so my thought on, on this was instead of going straight to, I thought it was going to be, they were going to need like parts, but they're actually all big enough for day old pinkies. Um, but there's not a whole lot to a day old pinky. There's not, it's a kind of a sack of goo. So I have a colony of morning geckos. Um, morning geckos are, a uh, um, part, well, the, from this population, they're parthenogenetic. So it's all females. They, they, they just continually lay eggs. 
and uh and the adults are like four inches long the 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 fresh hatchlings are like an inch long they're the tiniest little things and uh um these baby waggler's vipers they're big enough to handle like a half grown morning gecko and so um i um I wanted to leave them together a little bit longer, like Kyle was talking about, but I actually had some babies kill each other when that happened this time. So I had to separate them all out. And, uh, and I just, I put morning geckos in with all of them. And I, I, as they've been shedding, every time one of them sheds, they're all having their first sheds and I'm just throwing geckos in with them. And so far, a few of them have eaten them. And I'm hoping that giving them a, a, a whole natural prey item, giving them a lizard for their first, uh, their first meal will be a good jump start for them. Um, kind of get their gut health in line and all of that. And, uh, and then I'll move on to feeding them, um, getting them on pinkies. They, they strike readily enough that uh, I shouldn't, I don't think I'm going to have a problem tease feeding. And like uh, Kyle was saying, if, if I need to, I'll go to some scenting. Um, I, I, I keep geckos and, and some frogs in the freezer you thaw them out and just rub them on on there or you can do like i said and cut off a piece of the skin and put it on there um alex i got flavos to eat like that i actually cut off like frog toes and stuck them on the pinky spaces and shit um it's 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 probably really strange coming in here when i'm doing work like that in the baby room i i have this glass top desk in here and there are times when you walk in here and it's fucked up because there's just piles of mouse legs and mutilated rodents and lizards and shit all over my table while I'm in here kicked down and hot water and all that stuff, um, pulling out the tricks to, to get baby vipers and baby chondros and whatever else eating. Um, but uh, I, I, like Kyle said earlier, it's you know, got to give them what they want. Well, that's the problem with a lot of these things is we're trying to get them to eat things that are not natural. Uh, there are very few arboreal snakes on the planet that are going to get a, a nestling mouse as their first meal in the wild. <laughs> um, you know, but would do you, do you guys, did you happen to hear the Rich Crowley episode that I had where he said back in the 90s or something, they, they, they fed their baby chondros roaches and they were eating roaches roaches did you hear about that no nope. i thought it was pretty wild um that's pretty any, wild I mean, there are venomous snakes that do eat roaches or, or eat insects or something like that from what i've seen before correct or no yeah there's these like patty said when is a a, a little four inch long baby asian pit viper gonna encounter uh, a pinky mouse fucking never it's gonna awesome. eat a frog it's gonna eat a lizard it's gonna eat a little bug you know with pile stuff willard eye when they're babies their venom is designed to kill insects and then as they mature and get older and get bigger it switches to vertebrates for lizards and having been in their range and hiked around a little bit under every rock there's little crickets and little insects the same thing like for, for instance, with squams, their relative sawscale vipers in the desert start off with insects all day long. I've started sawscale oh. with insects, and mm -hmm. all of these little things, people don't take that into consideration. They're like, oh, my little tree viper, whatever the fuck, doesn't want to eat pinkies. And like, it's not eating pinkies in the wild. Give them frogs. Like, Whenever me and my buddies got a bunch of flavors in a few years ago, everyone else was beating their head against the wall, trying to feed them pinky parts, and everything from the Philippines wants frogs. Yeah, it was and the frogs that got them to go for me. Yeah, mine straight out of the box, you know, freaking this long, we're smashing whole frogs like nothing, and, you know, people are like, oh, scenting, oh, I gotta worry about switching them. To me, I don't give a fuck about sweetness. I would rather give it whatever it needs to get strong and healthy and stable. Then, once the animal is 100%, then I can switch it. That's easy. Yeah. I got all the time yeah. in the world to do that. I want to get it strong and stable and feeding, and then I don't worry about switching them. So, my go to is I offer everything pinks. If they don't want pinks, then I pull out the bags of frogs in the freezer or echoes or any other little thing. You know, it's the same thing as 
Kyle talked about give them what they want, what they're used to. And like Patty hit on, a pinky is shit for food. It's a, it's a filler to just make them grow to a point to eat something larger. If you take the pinky this big, that it's skin, barely formed guts, barely formed bones, and then there's milk, which doesn't eat any good. There's nothing there, and you take a frog of the same size that has bones with calcium, it has muscle tissue with protein, it has intestines, it has skin, it has everything. You know, if you want to give them the very best and make them the very best, well, you can feed them what they need if they want, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I, I don't know. I think a lot of people don't understand that they need to just have everything ready to go. Like, you know, I think a lot of the new era of keeping is like, oh, let me get a snake and let me see what the most common thing is to feed the snake. And they don't really understand that. Yeah, whatever's common doesn't mean it's the right thing. Like you need to have a diversity, a diversity selection of, of what it could possibly want. But I mean, let's be honest, Patrick, based off what we're hearing right now, it doesn't sound too crazy if a baby neonate chondro was to happen to eat a roach in the wild or some shit well I, I don't i won't say it's too crazy because they're they're obviously opportunistic feeders if they were not opportunistic um I, like today i got five uh, five more of my baby beox to eat this morning they just started shedding out um and i'm feeding them pinkies that are scented with chick down in the wild they eat almost almost entirely baby chondros across the across their range are eating skinks there but so um and adult chondros eat rats babies eat skinks adults eat rats but to say that they won't deviate from that is crazy and i'm sure that baby chondros if they if the right thing runs in front of them at the wrong time whether it's a frog or a gecko or some type of insect. Uh, I, I don't see that, that that's crazy. Just because, but the, it is, as far as I can tell from the, the work that's been done, baby chondros predominantly eat skinks. But I, I have, um, these days, I've gotten good enough at it with the type of movement that I don't have a lot of problem getting them to take mice. And it it, it doesn't make any sense that, that, that chicks chick down works. A lot of people used to think that's because they're bird eaters, but there's no evidence that even adult chondros ever consistently eat birds and, uh, and definitely not the babies. Um, and, uh, you know, another example, um, we're talking uh, of vipers and we're talking about insects. Copperheads are notorious insect eaters. Baby copperheads fucking love caterpillars and adult copperheads will get out and hunt cicadas when they're emerging in the spring. I've seen it in front of, you know, y'all have probably seen the pictures I posted. I've, I've I've seen it happen in the wild. It's it's badass. And Kyle has posted a you posted at least one video of a of a baby copperhead eating a hornworm or something, didn't you? Yeah, I mean I posted several videos of that kind of stuff. But babies yeah. and even my adults they eat cicadas every year. Uh, they'll eat grasshoppers. They'll eat worms. So yeah. Kyle, Kyle, do you even have the same technique uh, when it comes to feeding every every venomous baby? Like, do you have the same method? across the board or is it all different depending the depending the species i mean it, it's pretty much the same across the board um i generally feed a lot of lizards um and then i'll you know i add in pinkies uh and then some some snakes i mean they they don't want to eat lizards as often as they want to eat a pinky so it just kind of depends, you know, each one's different, but generally speaking, it's lizards and, uh, and pinkies for me. And how soon after they're born, do you like to try to get them to eat? Um, I let them go probably about 15, 20 days. And Alex, you do the same thing or what's your approach when offering a first meal to one of your babies? No, I'm, uh, so the old method and the old idea was to um, let everything shed first. And so with me, if you think about it, a baby is born, look like you're looking at its, its health meter like a gas tank. It's born, it's full, it's 
it's tip top time shape. So then you let it sit for 10 days, two weeks, a week. And that snake doesn't just sit stationary until it sheds. That snake is cruising, it's burning calories, it's exercising, it's moving, it's burning off that nutrients that it was, it's, you know, it's, it's living off of that. So then by the time it sheds, that tank is just about down to empty. Then you start trying to stress this animal out and get it to feed. So what's it doing when it's striking, when it's running, when it's not wanting to eat? It's then burning calories. So then you have an animal at you know, a low tank of fuel, and then you fuck with it, and it burns calories. So then you you basically have a compromised animal you're trying to get to eat. And it's an uphill battle. And say you jack with this baby for 15 minutes and it's burning calories and you get it to eat two pinky legs. nutrition in there. So you're not even getting it back to square one with that meal. So if I had snakes born tonight, I would them in the morning, set them up, you know, and I soak them all right away, teach them to drink some body water, and they get, you know, they, they, but I feed everything at 24 hours old, like, you know, they're born today, I'm feeding them tomorrow, and consistently, I can get two feeds in by the first shed, and, you know, by my eyelash litter this last year, uh, about the third feet, they were on the whole piece, you know. And the, those animals now, at a year, are 12, 13 inches long in fucking tanks because you start from square one. Because in the wild, if this baby falls out of mom's ass and crawls and then sits there for 10 minutes and a little prey item walks by, it's going to be like, oh, hey, hit me up next week after I shed. So <laughs> there an opportunity. No time yet. <laughs> Well, let's let's be clear though on that. Uh, not to not to interrupt, but it's necessary. We got to be clear that this is species specific because yeah, absolutely. You, yeah. You, uh, maybe maybe Alex's snakes do that. You try to yeah. feed my snakes before they shed. Ninety nine percent of them refuse to eat until yeah. after their first shed. Period. Yeah. I don't care what you offer them. Yeah. Now, now chondros are a little like there's people who do a little bit of both. Patrick, right? Some yeah. Some you post uh, post uh, post pre for shed and, and so with with green trees they they're so um, full of yolk when they if they absorb their yolk oh sometimes they don't um, but if they fully absorb their yolk when they emerge they're so full that if you try to feed one in the first like three days or four days they'll regurge um, and then that's really a setback. Um, I used to try to feed everything right before they entered the shed cycle so at like six or seven days old right before they would start clouding up but i had so little success getting them to eat like that and 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 i what i will say is the ones that would eat three shed man they were Monster. they were off to a uh, they were off to a serious start yeah they'd get they'd have a big head start on their siblings um because they don't shed until they're like 10 to 15 days old um but i just had so little success getting them to shed um that now or getting them to eat three shed that i just don't even try anymore but um on this to um go along with what alex was saying about them being depleted uh you know there's a lot of guys that say force feeding chondros is a death sentence and that's utter bullshit either you suck at it or you're waiting too long to do it and if you wait until they're depleted then yeah absolutely that snake will die in your fucking hands from stress because it's already so fucked up i will um if if a baby is not showing clear progress towards accepting food i will force feed them before they're four weeks old because that for that's and again like kyle said species specific for green tree pythons that's where it's at but all snakes are different um there are some snakes that can handle it. Uh, Alex, do you feed your colubrids real early on to your baby bulls? So I did that last year just to see. Uh, and um, I want to say that, like, I think I did it with one clutch last year of bulls. And I think, like, yeah. seven out of ten, eight before yeah. the 
Yeah. And then the other ones were like, fuck you guys. And then they shed. That's interesting. You would think that a bull snake would eat before yeah. it was even out of the egg. Yeah, no, they, I mean, they all start on frozen dog fuzzies. Right yeah, that. monsters. Like, yeah, but, but yeah, it was interesting. I was like, well, let me try it and see, you know. And it, yeah. the results were, you know, meh. But I, with the, it, and it's definitely, you know, with time, I mean, you're letting everything stay in there and shed naturally and go through all that. That's a completely different deal. And they learned yeah. that that and that makes sense you know those snakes they're born and they stay together and stay in little groups with the royal vipers mom's dropping them as she's crawling down a branch and it's like cool peace good luck right. yeah. Uh, yeah they all they all take off and that, i i suggested that method to quetzal dwyer and jim campbell and they're both people that have been doing this shit longer than all of us have been alive. And they both were, have started doing it and kept so told his friend in Ecuador about it. And she started to talk about it at the last uh, the pit peppers. And, and so for our boil shit, I, that's what I'm going to do forever. And, you know, it works for me. I, I do think my way because I see my result consistently and so I can change my ways, you know, unless I'm doing something better. Um, I sent a, I, I donated a pair of these eyelash or the, I'm sorry, the um, Waggler's Vipers to, to Reptilandia and um, they were in shed when they went down there and Ari sent me pictures of both of them eating parts eating mouse legs or something while they were in their first shed cycle the day he got them as soon as he got them in the containers that i sent him in and he sit and he got them to eat so yeah now I, you had you said something alex about like you like to soak them when, after they're born um I, 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 what's your method so, with that? Like, what type of soaking do you do um so when everything's born like you know, they have afterbirth on them or some species yeah. squams shed the minute they come out of mom. And so you soak to get all that off because, you know, sometimes that will dry and be crispy on a little baby in a different place. And, you know, yeah. so soaking them gets that all off. The minute you drop these babies in the water, everybody starts drinking. And I, I don't miss baby squams. And so I direct, I think that directly dropping them in the water and teaching them right then they drink from a standing bit of water, then they go into a tub that associated in standing water with drinking because I never, I never miss it. And they, they don't die. They all drink water from a bowl from day one. And then I see other people that, you know, put them on wet paper towel when they're born you know, and those babies have shed issues, and shed issues are directly related to a snake being hydrated. It's not about spraying the fucking snake. If your snake is not shed well, it's not. It's you have to be hydrated to create that oil that separates the outer layer of skin to where it's in one piece. That's why when you pick up a fresh shed, it feels oily, and you're like, oh, that's, that's weird and sticky. That's the oil to create, and if they're not hydrated, they can't create that. So I see the consistency in soaking the babies right away, and then drinking, and then both. That's neat. What, uh, what else you got, Stephen? Um, I was going to kind of just button up that with uh, an anecdote from, from my personal experience, not venomous related, but uh. With the with the scrub pythons, for instance, some of those babies they'll take months to shed. Last year, the uh, yeah. one baby take a little over six months to have its first shed. Holy um, shit. So you know, you're not going to be waiting for that shed. Um, you know, I, I had some babies eat close to ten meals before they had their first shed. Um, yeah, that's crazy. And, uh, it, yeah, it really is. Um, but I think overall, this is a good testament to just. You know, you've got to read your animals and, and, you know, listen to them. Listening to advice is wonderful, but that advice can only be applied to such a degree to 
your room, your animals, where you are, the climate, the elevation, yada, 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 all these, all these factors. Um, so, you know, the way that Alex does it, the way Kyle does it are night and day different, but they work perfectly for both of them. And uh, I think that speaks a lot to just, you know, how much really this comes down to being in tune with your, your animals and uh, trusting yourself too, as, as the keeper, trusting your ability to take notes and, you know, read the situations properly to where you're doing stuff better for your animals going forward. Um, yeah, go ahead. I guess uh, kind of in gears a little bit, going back to something that we were talking about previously, but I think I'd, I'd like to hear more of it in depth, and I think it'd be good for everybody listening. Um, and this would be primarily for uh, for Alex and Kyle, uh, but I mean, Patrick is, has more than enough to add to this too. Um, you know, when you are selling venomous snakes, and you have a first-time customer that is uh, that is coming to you, somebody that you don't know from somebody off the street. Um, you know what? What do you look for in that person? Like, what are your criteria, so to speak, for you know entrusting somebody to purchase a venomous snake? From you? Um, because obviously, new people have to start somewhere. And also, as you're running a business, you need to sell your snakes. So what's, and you guys quite obviously do this a lot. So what's the process as far as that goes with new people? Uh, so for me, I don't really like selling someone their first venomous snake. I don't, you know, I, I know we all start somewhere. Yeah. Um, I've done it a few times with people that like, you know, say, hey, I've been working with so-and-so. I'm familiar. I don't have anything yet myself, but I've been, you know, working with this and I've gotten some experience, you know, and it's someone that I like or clicks. And so, you know, I'll kind of coach them and help them and stuff. Uh, but my big thing is I'm going to talk to somebody, you know, to see, see if they actually um, have you know, the decision-making abilities, you know, uh, well-spoken, like, I'm fucking judgmental, you know, I, and I, I get nine million uh, message requests and, and texts and people like, how much are your vipers, blah, 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 and I don't even answer any of that shit, I don't have time for it, I don't want to hear it, I'm, you know, like, I just, I don't, I don't like selling dangerous animals to, you know, just random folks. So typically, you know, when people come up to shows, it's someone I've seen around or I, I, I know of. And, or, I, you know, I talk to people. I'm like, what do you currently keep? You know, what have you had? How long have you been doing this? You know, um, and a lot of it is like I sell somebody this little baby tree viper and they're, they're new and they're learning like, all right, uh, this snake is little and it's a little baby and odds are if they make a mistake and get bit, they're going to be all right. It's going to maybe fuck their finger, screw up their weekend, but they're probably not going to die. That's why I don't sell shit like mambas. Uh, I, I, yeah, have, man. I have cake cobras and they're kind of an expensive cobra. So, you know, and they're... Um, they're not a snake that everybody wants. Everybody wants somebody might want them, but not everyone's gonna drop, you know. You said so, king cobra? Cape cobras. Oh. An African cobra. You know, but they're that's that's the only lapid I keep at the moment, you know. And so I don't I don't really like selling cobras because, you know, those snakes, even a tiny little baby, someone can get bit and they might be in respiratory failure in twenty minutes, you know, they might not. And uh you know, as shitty as it is and as, you know, asshole as it is, most of the people that keep cobras are dipshits. Most of the people that keep my yeah. dipshits. You know, there's, there's a handful of people that are skilled and educated and love mambas and keep mambas, but those people are yeah. not mambas. So they yeah. don't need mambas. So I don't need to sell mambas. You know, and same thing with cobras. Like, yeah, 
if I get a group of babies from somebody, I'll sell them, but I'm very selective of who's going to get them. And, you know, I anyone that bends with me will tell you that I refuse to sell without thinking twice. Like two, three hundred bucks that I'm going to get from this jack wagon isn't worth my reputation or a headline or them getting injured and dying. Like, it's not worth it to me. It's stupid. But I'm fortunate enough that I have a good enough client base that I don't have to do stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, most of, again, it sounds kind of shitty, but most of my stuff is on the expensive side. And that kind of weeds out a lot of the dipshits and scrubs that are going to make poor choices, are going to hurt themselves, or just going to kill the snakes. You know, it's specialty stuff like Kyle and his stuff. It's specialty, expensive, high-end snakes that not every jackass is going to want to buy. You know, so it's kind of kind of self-governed in a way. Yeah, I definitely want to work with shit where someone has the nerve to ask me how much I just scare the shit out of them. Fuck yeah, them. like when I, bend, when, I, when I bend shows, I don't write the names of the snakes on the delis, or if I do, it's like the Latin name. Because if you walk up and you don't know what it is, you don't need it. You know? <laughs> That's a it. very, very simple and straightforward way to do it. If you got to be like, what is that? That's not for you. Don't worry about it. I mean, I'll tell them, obviously, but, you know, that right there is another system to, you know, weed out the nonsense. So, boom, you're a window shopper. That's all you are, buddy. <laughs> uh, did you hear the question, Kyle, from, from Steven about customers? Um, what was it? Say it again, Steven. So, um, you know, when you're selling a venomous snake to somebody who is either a new keeper or a new client of yours, what's your kind of vetting process uh, for them as a new person who uh, you're selling snakes to? Um, I just want to make sure that I, I, I have sold to some new keepers before. Um, but what I always try to do is kind of, I don't know if the right word is coach, but, you know, kind of guide them uh, into how I keep snakes and how I think, uh, that they should be keeping snakes. And, um, a lot of the time it's those new keepers who keep, you know, better than 90% of the people out there because they don't have anything to base keeping off of. They don't, they haven't looked at people's collections on fucking Aspen bedding. They haven't looked at people's collections in a shoebox rack. No offense to anybody, but you know, I want to make sure that my snakes are going to people who are going to be keeping them like myself. So I do take the time um, to talk to them, to answer every single question I can, show them pictures of my setups, and just kind of provide examples of, of what works for me and how I kind of expect for my snakes to be kept by them. Yeah. And do you think there's a certain age? Like, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, because you guys all started very young. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? Um, and obviously parental ad advisory is also like ideal, but like, I mean, future is everything for the youth. Um, do you think there's like, like how, how can the, how can the, a younger person who's really dedicated to this maybe approach to get into this? Like, do, do you feel like something like that thousand hour type thing is good for a younger person or, or overall, what do you guys think of that? Having a thousand hours uh, under your belt in order to keep venomous sound to you guys. Just curious. I think it's ridiculous, personally. Um, I know guys that have been keeping snakes for 40 years, and they suck ass at it. Um, I know yeah. guys that have been keeping snakes for three months, and they are excellent. They have great techniques. They handle the snakes properly. Uh, they're in it for, for the right reasons. Um, as far as age goes, I don't think, obviously, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to give a little 12 year old uh, a venomous snake. Uh, but for me, I started keeping when I was 15 years old. The vast majority of the population would probably say that that's too young. Right. But my heart was in it. My head was in it. Um, I knew what I wanted to do. And I started doing it, you know, um, which just a little side topic. I wanted to mention this as well, as far as like the people who, you know, advise others on keeping, um, you know, like make sure you keep corn snakes before you keep a venomous snake 
Well, that's fu- that's bullshit to me, dude. You don't ever go out and shoot a water gun to learn how to shoot a shotgun. You know what I'm saying? Um, it just don't work, dude. If you're into something and you love it, that's what you need to keep. Yeah. You need to learn as much as you can about it. You need to talk to as many people as you can who have the experience before you get into it. But if you want to keep a King Cobra, get yourself a fucking King Cobra because nothing else is going to teach you about it like it will. Heavy respect. Um, listen, Stephen, do you have a couple wrap up or a wrap up question you want to get ready while I ask him another one or are you ready to go? I, I, I actually, you. I've got a question too. Um, I haven't asked you yet, Patrick. I was going to get to you, buddy. You're, you're okay. Just, I can you're, wait. Oh, you're just I can you're wait. Being, being very excited down there, buddy. I am. I'm stoked. All right. Well, listen. I go ahead, Stephen, and then we're going to so, go. To you, and th- this could be kind of quick because it'll be reiterating. But I kind of wanted to flip this question around and uh, ask you guys: If you were starting over right now, you're a new customer. You are starting a new venomous collection, uh, how would you approach it? How would you approach people you want to get animals from? You know, what, what would you see as, with your knowledge now, the best way to get started? I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with that one um, because it, I, it would be a, an easier way to do it the same way that I did it before. I got started before there was the internet and when you when you have no internet and you have every book in the library memorized then what else do you do you have to reach out to people so i started getting in with the guys at the dallas zoo i still remember the phone number to the dallas zoo it's 214-670-7573 i used to blow those motherfuckers up and bug the shit out of them starting when i was about 12 years old and that's how i met winston card and ended up meeting rustin and started to get, that's how I met Ari was through Rustin and started getting tours in the in the, the backs of the zoos and seeing all the cool shit back there. So I just had to reach out to guys that 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 did these things that I dreamed about doing. And uh, but the thing is that now we have the internet and it makes it infinitely easier to just reach out to people. And that's what it is. Reach out say this is what I'm interested in. I love it when people hit me up for a green tree python and they've never kept the green tree python before. I love that shit. Yeah. And uh and so that's what that's that's you've got so much information that you can have access to that we that I didn't have access to when I was a kid and so many hundreds and hundreds thousands of people that you can reach out to online and just express your interest and start asking lots of questions. Oh, yeah. go, Alex, uh, Alex. Any, anything to add to what Patrick said? Um, yeah, you know, like, look for, you know, same thing. Uh, when I wanted to start doing this, I know I told my mom I wanted a pet snake. She's like, all right, you need to read and learn about them and figure out what you'll need and what you need to know. And I did the same thing. I went to the library and got every book I could. And started reading, um, you know, from there. Uh, nowadays, what I see is everyone wants to get on a forum and be like, "Hey, I just bought this. Spoon feed me everything I need to know to set it, and go ahead and supply me pictures with your setups too." And that's fucking stupid. Like, do your own research. Yeah, you know? pretty annoying. If someone comes to me with an educated question or they're like, hey, uh, I'm looking at getting into these. I've been reading XYZ and I'm studying this part of the you know, globe and I like this group of snakes. You know, can you offer a couple pointers? And that's great. Because that's what I do. I still ask questions of people because there's shit I don't know. You know, I know a fraction of what there is to know. People have forgotten more than the shit I know. But I, I go to the people, you know, that do this stuff. Like when I was getting started with a therapist, I reached out to Christian Moisander. I reached out to Jim Campbell. I reached out to Derek Morgan. And these people were doing it, 
you know, uh, way back in the day and, and have been doing it ever since. And I, you know, I, I text Sir, above, Sir, this is what I'm interested in. And I know that you are one of the, you know, leaders in this gang and this group. And I was just wondering if I could pick your brain a couple of questions. You know, and much specific question. You know, um, just research and um, what Kyle was saying about seeing new people take off with it that's, that's the good stuff and the new people that don't know the old shit ways of people learning new ways you know, there, I have noticed a big shift in the way people are keeping nowadays more people are wanting to go naturalistic more people are wanting to offer all of these uh, variables, so the folks can do what they need to do to be happy. You know, so my big thing for new people is read, research. You know, research the weather, the seasons, the rainy season. You know, Google pictures of habitat. You know, uh, all of those things. You know, try to learn and then reach out to people that do. What you want. I wouldn't change I, I wouldn't. about the way I learned, man. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I learned was, you know, again, I have the fortune of living where I do and keeping the species that I keep. Um, but I learned from being out in the field. I, I, I mean, yeah. I don't read. I don't read stuff. I don't read. There ain't no books on clubs, really. Um, I'm out there. I'm I'm letting the I'm letting the snakes teach me where they live, how they live, what they're doing, when they're doing it. Um, and the more time that I've been able to spend in the field, the more that I learn about them. So um, and that and that's probably 75, 80 percent of the joy that I get out of what I do uh, is my time in the field and being able to apply what I learn out there into my snake rooms because there's nothing like being in a place, you know, you can, you can see what the temperature is. You can see what the humidity is, but you can't feel it unless you're there. Um, and that's, I travel all around the globe, dude. I, I told you I have snakes from South Africa and Namibia. Well, guess what? I went to every single one of those localities that I have snakes from and I put my feet on the ground and I fucking felt it and I saw it myself. Um, that's, I wouldn't change that for anything. Respect. And, and, and I feel I feel like um, th this day and age is like so easy to bring on a lazy keeper because at the end of the day they they do meet somebody who feels like well fuck maybe I give them this information they'll buy a snake for me you know and and that's how a lot of people are easily spoon fed information but you guys all know experience is the best teacher it doesn't matter what the fuck who the hell tells you what to do you're gonna find out until this shit happens firsthand uh, but right. nothing 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 hits home harder than going to the actual place. Um, and, and seeing where the fuck, like what the fuck is up, and that's a unique position you're in, Kyle, and, and even you, Patrick, and and Alex. Like you guys have sick ass shit in your backyard um, that really relates to uh, what you guys like to keep. But for the most part, you know, um, you, you know, fuck, man, if you really want it, you got to go out there and get it, you know. And and that kind of determines your longevity in this game. You know, the lazy keeper don't last in this for too long because you know they're they're gonna they're gonna get tired of fucking up. You know what I mean? And, and, and by them creating more shortcuts, they're going to continue to fuck up. And until you actually put in work and, t and take the long route, you know, it's kind of when you kind of know your worth in this game. Um, but Patrick, did you have a, a question you want to ask? I do. I want to make two really quick comments just on what, what Kyle and, and Alex both said. Um, I've said this about Kyle before. Um, I'm sure there's some dudes that like, you know, breed corn snakes and live in Florida and sure they like spend lots of time in corn snake habitat or whatever, but it's their backyard and I'm sure they're not out there observing corn snake behavior. I have, I've been doing this shit for literally my whole life. I'm 42. My dad had snakes since I was a baby. I've done this for my whole life and I've never ever met anybody who keeps snakes that spends as much time in the habitat of the snakes they keep as Kyle does. Nobody on earth does that. There's lots of guys who spend a lot of time in snake habitat, but they're doing research and field studies and whatever else and don't maybe don't keep anything at all. 
I've, I'm unaware of anybody on earth who spends that le level of time and, and has that much experience in the habitats of the snakes that they keep at, as Kyle does. Yeah. Um, and, and it's fucking amazing to me. And it's, um, it's, it's very inspiring because I mean, I'll never forget when Steven fucking hauled ass over there and he, you went on that camping trip with him and, and you were fucking dude, Steven was gone for, I don't know how many days you were fucking off the grid, bro. But I was like, you good man and you you're in fuck you you look like you really went through it and it was great like i, I could tell you yeah. that you wanted you know and and how much did that elevate you being with those snakes now steven well it's a it's a complete paradigm shift with with keeping reptiles completely you know especially being out there being off the grid no service no nothing it's just you nature and, and the animals you know get you outdoors to, uh give you time to kind of process everything that you thought you knew and every way that you chose how to do things. Um, yeah. Definitely one of the most kind of transformative experiences for me was going out there with Kyle and, and really seeing what it's really like. The real deal. Um, my, Michael Novi from Rainforest Junkies, anybody who's ever been at, at Ten Lee or these big shows knows Mike. He's a real good fucking dude. He had, he, he's one of the leading tree frog breeders in the world. And before he ever went to Costa Rica, he had produced tens of thousands of frogs, tens and tens of thousands of frogs, tons of different species. And he told me the first time he went to Costa Rica that it just totally changed his outlook on the way he, he keeps and breeds everything. And it's just an absolute dream of mine to go spend time in green tree python country, man, or, and they, and, or in Costa Rica or wherever. That's, there's nothing... Literally nothing I want to do more than go spend time in other places in the world in snake habitat. And no joke, if it came down to it, I, I would get rid of literally every animal that I keep if I had the resources to just spend all my time looking at them in the wild. Um, but you, you, yes, you, would, you would give it all up? What about Amber, bro? If, 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 if uh, Amber would be doing it with me. Okay. Um, I was going to say, you just live at home with no animals? No, no, no. Um, but I also want to say something really quick on, um, cause I think it's important on what Alex was saying about reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. I, two things that he said, I all the time get messages too. And it's somebody saying how much you sell them bush vipers for or whatever, or just how much, how much are those vipers? Like don't even specify their spelling and punctuation is fucked up. I don't even reply to that shit. If you can't even form a fucking sentence to reach out to me, I have no interest in doing business with you. But I also way more often, fortunately, have people reach out. They don't express interest in spending money. They, they say, I'm sorry to bother you, but I was wondering if I could pick your brain about this, this, and this. It could be somebody in fucking Germany. It frequently is somebody that I'll never get a penny from. And I have never, ever said no to that. I always say, absolutely. Ask me any question, anytime. So if you want to reach out to somebody to learn anything about anything, that's the way to do it, man. Don't, don't send a half of a sentence saying how much for that snake. Say, hey, man, I want to learn about this. And I always, always answer those messages. Man. People don't um, understand. To, to add that, though, to add to that, um, for anyone who's listening who's in that position, those messages are the the rarity amongst the the massive messages at least for me personally the the well thought out yes. thoughtful construct like well constructed you know right. message where there is intention behind it they want to learn something that that's you know that's a diamond in the rough compared to the how much for that i want this you know right. from, of those messages so they will be noticed too um, yeah. mm -hmm. And that people like us us more than people who share that same passion and, and you know, especially uh, an interest that can be kind of cultivated, you know, somebody who's new. That's that's something that, you know, anybody who's worked salt in this game absolutely loves. And I, I got to tell you, this this reptile industry is where I kind of learned how how important an approach is like your your approach is everything as far as the impression you want to leave on the person you're asking, because you got to understand that you're probably asking the same question a million other people ask, but how are you asking it? Are you fucking, are you, are you expecting the answer? Are you coming saying, Hey, tell me how to fucking do this. Or are you coming really in a place where I'm just trying to learn, you know, and, and, and listen, I know some things can be misinterpreted 
via text, but it's too easy to be polite in text. It's not, it's not that fucking difficult. And all you got to do is think thoroughly what you're asking because it's kind of you only get one shot. I mean, you already know how Alex will fuck around, bro. You fucking <laughs> I, I think that some of it is also, you know, based on what you keep, particularly, yeah. uh, I, get, I mean, MJ, Steven, and, uh, and Patrick, you know, me and Alex, we keep species that aren't all that popular, you know. We, there might be, and I'm, I don't know exact numbers, so forgive me, uh, but just, you know, there might be 100 people in the United States who keep, you know, um, bush vipers and clobber eye. There's thousands of people that keep ball pythons and green trees and shit like that. So you guys are going to run into that a lot more often than I think either Alex or I would. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Fair enough. Um, Patrick, did you have a – we're past two hours, but I, I want to give you your time. Do you yeah, want I'm going to I'm gonna have to shorten this a lot because I feel like we could spend another two hours talking about this I subject, and, may, may, and maybe we should. But it's um, – I have a question for, for Kyle um, and for Alex um, about um, naturalistic versus bioactive because Alex does all tropical stuff or largely tropical stuff, and – um, you know, Kyle keeps, um, you know, terrestrial and montane stuff um, and some, some desert vipers. Um, Kyle, are any of your enclosures actually bioactive? Like, do you have bugs in there for cleanup crew or are they all just naturalistic? No, no, no. All of my montane stuff, not all of it. You know, the exception is the babies for the most part. Mm -hmm. But uh, the big cages, the adults and stuff. Yeah, I guess they're they're bioactive. They got little bugs in there all over the place. Um, I, I never clean cages. I mean, I, I just, it's not something that I do. I'll pull a shed here and there, uh, yeah. or spray some shit into the substrate a little bit. But other than yeah. that, I'm not, I'm not cleaning cages, man. That was exactly my question. Um, why I was asking the question, because I was, uh, that was the next thing that I was going to lead it to is how frequently do you clean your cages? <laughs> Um, and that's, that's exactly what I'm looking, looking at. And same thing for you, um, Alex, I know you keep your adults, um, your arboreal vipers and whatnot in bioactive. Is it the same thing with you or are you just maybe doing a little bit of spot cleaning every once in a while? Like how, how often do you have to pull shit apart? Um, I have, I think 60 planted bio setups and the only ones that I clean are the two Deboya enclosures because <laughs> they take fat ass shits. And so, but even then, like, I'll, I'll clean the big initial waste after the meal, but then yeah. the other little bits after that breaks down. And, yeah. you know, I've posted videos on my story of like, a fresh shit and there's literally like 80 isopods all over it and like again that room there's there's like 96 snakes in there and it has zero snake smell because of all the planted enclosures and i continually add bugs i continually add leaf litter and you know they they're self-sustaining and i'll pull a shed like you know, uh, usually a shed gets dropped, and by the next day, everything on the shed, that if it's going through the branches, everything that would have been touching the ground is eaten up to where they can't reach anymore, and I'll pull the yeah. last bit off the branch. And, yeah. You know, uh, other than that, like, all the arboreal vipers, I don't really ever clean those because they shit two times a month, and it's this, you know, this big, and the yeah short work of it um, it's, it's great because i don't have to interact i don't have to mess with stuff so, so you're just changing y'all are both you guys just changing water bowls change water bowls and add leaf litter the the yeah. bullies and springtails eat down leaf litter yeah yeah continually add leaf litter and, yeah uh, and do that um i did have excuse me i did have one snake that I can see the issue. I know that I think I had a die off of roly polies in there. Um, yeah. And so it, I was doing the same, not cleaning, but then I think I had a die off of uh, isopods 
and then there was some shit because I opened that cage and then I, I, I watered everything and I opened that cage the other day, a couple weeks ago. And I was like, oh, it smells bad in there. And yeah. you no, know, that's because the crew, the, the, the cleanup crew died off, you know. And yeah. so, again, with that, that enclosure and little bit of natural setup that told me something was wrong without me having yeah. to go through and do anything because the cages don't smell otherwise. And so yeah. out of the norm is, oh, I, it smells. Okay, I need to add bugs. I need to not let, I not, not let it get wet. I need to let it dry out. You know, yeah. kind of uh, I have fresh substrate. I'm going to add fresh soil to it and scrape off the top layer and kind of give it a jump start back. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I've noticed super quick is like, Part of being successful with these snakes is being vigilant and seeing issues and problems before it becomes an issue and a problem. And you see these things. And yeah. a lot of people have snakes and they look at their snakes every day, but they're not paying attention. They're not noticing that that snake is sitting different or that snake is you know, doing it. I know, I know without a doubt, Kyle can go in his room and walk down the row of enclosures, and if one thing is off, he'll know it. If one thing is unusual, he'll know it, because he looks at those snakes all day, every day, and he knows every individual snake's behavior and pattern. The same thing with me. I can walk down the row. If one snake is not in its same spot that it's in every day, or one thing is off, I know it, and then I start paying extra attention to it. And then... Yeah. It goes from there and I see it or whatever, you know. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. Being vigilant. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just about the, like, the low maintenance is, is super ideal, but I just really love plants, and I love seeing arboreal vipers in planted enclosures. Is like, any of us, when we were kids, we went to the zoo, and we saw arboreal vipers in naturalistic enclosures, and we're like, holy shit, this is, like, the coolest fucking thing ever. Right. And, uh, and yeah. that's why I'm trying to get all of my stuff like that. And so um, all three of you guys, because Steven's been doing it, too. I just have to get on the phone with all of you guys um, to help me get that set up, because it's I got I'm trying to make it happen this year uh, with can, all, all the adults. Or we can just do a round two. And get, get this all out Let's do that, line. too. Let's do all of that. I'll, let you, host, that. I'll let you host it, Patrick. Go into Central America <laughs> and seeing wild eyelash perched on a branch in the fucking trees. Yeah. It on the planet. I, I, I'll tell you what, um, I was talking to Bill Lamar the other day. Thanks for hooking me up with him because he's fun to talk to. Um, he told me that he remembers the first time that he ever saw an eyelash viper in captivity perching the way that wild eyelash vipers do. And he said, yeah, this guy's got it set up right just because he, he's seen so many of them in the wild. And he's like, most people, they don't perch like this in captivity. Yours are perching right. That means you have them set up right. Yeah. All right. So listen. Uh, but one, well, before you, you begin, but I just want to add one last thought to the naturalistic enclosure. I think it does more than just for the snakes. One thing that I try to do and anybody who, you know, we've taught how to take care of, of venomous and trained over here is, uh, is minimizing the contact. And, you know, when you have any number of, of venomous snakes, but especially a, a greater number, you know, we're just around a hundred animals. Um, you know, you gotta think about your safety in every engagement you have with these animals. Um, when you have these naturalistic or bioactive setups, you know, you're not having to change paper. You don't have to take every snake and put it into a holding container. You can limit the interactions with the actual animals and therefore limit the amount of times that you're subjecting yourself to a possible bite. Yes. Yeah. And especially like everything that, that we have with the exception of the, the bang, bang shan vipers and like the bitus parviocula, you know, the tools are long enough to work around the animals if they're in the right position and never be within their strike range. Swapping yeah. with tools, spot cleaning with tools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's one thing I feel like is very important that the naturalistic setups and bioactive kind of add to the equation is not just better for the animal. They're going to breed better. They're going to thrive. It's much safer for the keeper as well. Yeah. Yeah. So check this out. 
Patrick Holmes. Let's just say Patrick called it a day on the nine to five. No more nine to five. All of a sudden, Patrick's a monster at editing. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna start vlogging my life. I'm a full time reptile keeper now, and I'm gonna start recording what I do every day because I feel like I have good practices. And I feel like I may lead by example. And, and like I said, I'm a good editor now. So now I'm a vlogger on YouTube, right? Who would subscribe to that YouTube channel here? I, I would. Any of you guys would subscribe to that? Okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. I want to hear this. So so, so what I'm meaning is like, for instance, like Patrick, I, I, I know for a fact that if you were to do that, not even though, even though I know you wouldn't, but if you were to do that, I would just know for a fact, like I'm going to learn from this guy. Because I know him that well, and I know that he's always trying to learn, right? So is, is, is there no such thing as being a venomous keeper and being on YouTube without looking like an asshole? <laughs> Man. That's my question. So I think that you can do it. I think it can be done. I think that if, like, I feel like I could make venomous keeping content and not look like an asshole. The problem is that most of the people who do stuff like that they want to do it because they're the type of person who looks like an asshole on the internet doing that type of shit. Um, I, I, um, I would love to create educational stuff, but educational stuff doesn't make, doesn't get views. It doesn't make you any money. Looking like an asshole swinging a fucking King Cobra around is what gets, gets clicks and views and makes people money. And, uh, you know, so, um, and look, if I started vlogging my daily life, you guys wouldn't want to watch any of that shit. I'm running around singing my ass off, 60% naked, and cleaning cages in between kettlebell swings bro, all my day bro, off. All you need is five minutes, bro. Five-minute clip, and you can just keep it moving. <laughs> <laughs> Real-life, accurate, venomous snake keeping isn't exciting, crazy shit. It's picking a snake up with a hook and moving it. And doing what yeah. you're doing and picking it up and putting it but, back. But but if, but if there's none of that on there and all there is is the asshole shit, how is anyone supposed to know better? Because let's okay, yeah. let's make it, guys. At the end of the day, this is the future. What you're on right now, you're at the. This is it. This is where people come and learn. Okay, so we can't just. You know, I'm, not, I'm just saying in general, the people who know by best, as far as example wise, shouldn't keep themselves back from teaching people who come and watch it on here, regardless what the views are do it for the right reasons, right? And Patrick, I feel like if you did start vlogging, I feel like you would want to do it just to have that information out there. I don't think- No, absolutely. That, that's exactly what I meant when I said that. And I, um, I wasn't saying that I, I won't do it because I won't get views. I don't care about that. I'll, if, I, if I make content, it will be for education. And, I don't, and the people who need and want to watch it are the ones who will watch it and fuck the other. Like, because when, when somebody gets a million views for acting like an asshole- 950,000 of those people don't matter at all. To, to, they're not relevant to, to what's happening in the video. They're just random people that are seeing something that got shared because it's sensational. Um, I, I would love to have more time to do more stuff like that, but I, I have a lot on my plate and um, I'm really good at saying yes and taking things on, but I have a lot of room for improvement with my time management skills. So, yeah. And, um, and, and so Kyle, like for instance, if no matter how educational it is, no matter how fucking straightforward it is, you, in your opinion, you feel like that's still not good for, 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 for the, for the hobby, having any of that venomous content out there, you think? No, I think that, I think that it would be good for the hobby, um, in the right, in the right light. You know what I mean? Um, like you, I, like what, if, what if it was you? Like what if, what if you were the one that was fucking just a beast with editing and stuff like that? And you could somehow, implement it in your day I mean I don't know man to be honest with you I just don't think that enough people would give, give a, a shit yeah. about watching something like that as there are people who want to watch shit like Patrick said you know slinging a fucking King Cobra around or the sensational stuff man that's the stuff that 99% of the people want to see uh, again, I, it's not that I wouldn't do it for the one percent. It's just that I prefer to do it on a more personal level. You know, for people again, like we talked about, to to reach out to me um, specifically, and we talk one on one, and I'm able to answer yeah. their questions in real time, as opposed to kind of just showing them something along on 
on YouTube or, or some kind of educational video. Yeah. What do you think, Alex? I don't know. Uh, I have, you know, my friend Rhett, him and his girl have a YouTube channel, and it's not sensational, and it's them herping, and it's their captive stuff, and it's great. And it's educational, yeah. and, I, and I support it. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to do it myself. You know, I, I applaud people that do it. Like, I don't ever get on YouTube other than to watch music or listen to music. But, like, you know, I click subscribe on their shit because it, it helps them type. You know, I'm not going to watch it, but I support them in that aspect. And, you know, people, social media and, and people are too focused on the flashy, the bad. And then just because someone gets on YouTube or TikTok or anything and gets a million subscribers or a million views, people then, people just automatically assume that they're an expert. There's this guy that has 9 million people all over TikTok. And he posted shit on Facebook. Oh, I just got this many followers. And in my head, I'm like, but you still can't even visually sex a fucking rattlesnake with black and white band tail. You've never, <laughs> you've never read a fucking snake. Like, you, you know jack shit in real life, but you portray this fucking expert online and people are like, wow, you're amazing. And that kind of shit right there is what automatically makes me just fucking dislike all of the the channel people and the YouTube people and the sensational people, like all the people that have big names and are do that, it's all flashy sensational shit. And so I don't fucking like that. And that makes me dislike all of it and not want anything to do with it. You know, like it's just it's it's the wrong Unfortunately, it's the wrong demographic typically that follows that stuff. So is that, why you don't, is that why you don't have an iPhone? No, that's because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm smart. Same. Yeah. I'm, I'm smart. That's yeah. why I have an iPhone. I like good pictures. Oh, Me too. You know, so that's that. Um, <laughs> you know. Look, I'm, I'm gonna, this, is, this is a little bit of a shout out but on this subject there is only one reptile channel on YouTube that I watch consistently and it's DM Exotics Dan's channel is fucking legit it's, I'm, a, it's, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big Gary Shavino guy personally look, oh yeah you know what I watch Gary's videos too uh, but, uh, you, um, already got, no, you already said Dan I said Gary bro yeah so. no look hey Dan drops a lot more videos than Gary does so I'm Good. watching Dan's videos Gary's, twice Gary's a week way harder. Gary's way harder and I'm not just saying that because he's a sponsor look, but he's way Gary's, harder dog. Gary's videos and Dan's videos are two completely different things Gary's channel is 100% captive husbandry Dan is traveling around the world in the jungle digging up snakes, and it's fucking dope. Um, but yeah, yeah Gary is my tonight. dude, and I love his channel up, too. You messed up tonight, buddy. Um, hey, <laughs> look at look and see who I look and see who I subscribe to on there. I love you, man. I'm just kidding, Patrick. You're good. You're in a good place. Yeah. Man. Hey, fellas, listen. We had over 70 people tapped in to check out tonight's episode. Um, we'll start with you, Alex. What do you want to say to everyone out here showing you mad love and support and really enjoy tonight's episode? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. You had, you had your home, you had your, your home girl in here, girly girl snakes. She said something about uh, Boega, uh, that what the divergence. Do you get what's up with the divergent project? Somebody got a divergent project in here. Patty does. She's super gay for those blue mangroves. I tried telling her. <laughs> I try to tell her that melanota are the best, but you know, I love melanota. You can lead them to water, but you can't make them drink. And uh, yeah, you know, so. I have uh, I have one fertile Jimmy Sinta egg in the incubator right now too. Just one. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it doesn't matter what you keep as long as you do it well. I don't give a oh, shit yeah. what species you keep. Just do the very best you can for that species. And if you're not trying to be the very best at what you're doing, what's the fucking point? You know? Yeah. And, uh, True, passion, man. True words. All right. So, Patrick, uh, to you, what do you have to say? All your love and support out there, man. 
Um, well, obviously, um, I thoroughly appreciate it. Uh, it. It's always a trip to me, and I know it's the same way with, with these other guys on here. It's a trip to me how many people actually take their time to listen to us sit here and talk about snakes. It, it just blows my mind because um, I don't – I don't think I'm anybody special, man. Um, so I always appreciate that people spend their time to do this. And uh, I appreciate the people who reach out to me with actual questions. And I love all of you guys. And uh, that's, um, that's really all I can say. It's, it, it's, it's a trip. And uh, I'll, I don't think I'll ever get used to it. But I love it. And I love all the people that follow this stuff. Fuck yeah. Kyle. I mean, I'm just happy, uh, again, that, you know, people do listen and that, that me and Alex and Patrick and I guess Steven, um, <laughs> you know, we all get to we all get to share some insight into what we do and and how passionate we are about the stuff that we work with. Man, I think that that uh, is one of the most important things to put out there is is the passion behind keeping these animals uh that's what fuels it and that's why all of us strive to do it the very best that we can so yeah i mean uh, i'm 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 thankful over anything well shit i'm beyond thankful for you guys making this happen for me i mean this is kind of an iconic i'm sorry this is an iconic venomous round table first ever in trap talk history and this won't be the last oh we'll be definitely setting this up again uh in the future but guys do me a favor enjoy the rest of your night I uh, appreciate it so much. Guys, give it up for Alex, Patrick, and Kyle. It's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Right. You guys enjoy your night, okay? Have a good night. All right. Yeah. So, Stephen, and then there's this you and I, buddy. Um, very informative. How would you feel? Oh, about yeah. yeah, it was great. It was great. And, and we barely scratched the surface, too, which makes it all that much better. That's always the case when you're a part of the show because there's always that much more that you could tap into. Um, kind of wish everyone was an iPhone user. We would have good quality audio like this. But, uh, yeah, one day. <laughs> just kidding. What are you going to do, man? Fuck five people on the screen. I mean, either way, we still got our info out there. And, and, and listen, the dynamic was awesome tonight. And uh, first and foremost, uh, anyone out there who's rooting for you, Stephen, anyone out there who's uh, – just wanting to see you kick ass in the reptile industry. What do you have to say to all your love and support out there, Stephen? Because you got him, man. I'm one of them. So, well, thank you. Yeah, no, it's 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 great. Um, I'm super grateful that uh, I'm in the position I'm in. You know, this has kind of been well, not kind of it has been my dream since about you know eight or nine years old to be doing exactly what I'm doing right now. So, uh, yeah, everybody who's been a part of it along the way, I'm extremely grateful for everybody who's been vocal or watching quietly or even weren't watching at all, but we're just somehow part of it on the periphery. I'm, I'm extremely grateful. I have to ask you before you leave scrub production, where we at? I mean, are, are, are you where you want to be right now or are you getting there? Oh, what's, yeah. what's going on with, with, uh, with uh, the scrub projects? Um, it's, it's going well. Um, I still am very much in the figuring out how to breed these things phase. Um, yeah. And uh, should have hopefully some cool stuff to talk about soon, I guess is how I'll say that. Um, but uh, the babies from last year are all growing and doing well. Uh, actually, this week just went through and sexed all of them. And um, based off of that, we'll be making some available probably in the next month or so, month and a half. Um, I have some older animals in 2020s available as well. So if anybody out there has been looking for scrub pythons, has been interested recently, um, you know, hit me up. Uh, captive bred, true captive bred scrub pythons are, are not the easiest to come by these days. I will say there are a number of people now in the States who have bred them and are doing great with them. So it's, it's most certainly not only me, um, but for, for bar neck scrubs in particular, uh, unless Rob Christian decides he wants to sell any of his, which... I'm pretty sure he has not. I'm about all you got um, <laughs> at the moment. At the moment, so uh, I guess that's well. That's what I'll say there. Um, but hopefully, in the years to come, the the scrub python project is only going to keep growing, and uh, I have a lot of a lot of work I want to do with it. So it's very far from complete. Before I let you go, man, I'm sorry, but I have an invisible stick, and I'm gonna I'm gonna poke the fire just a little bit, man. 
because you know steven i respect that you are somebody who just does this thing you're not very outspoken even though if asked you like to you know you'll, you'll say on it but you know it, neglect to the point where it needs to be exposed is that a good thing that we should i mean i and seriously like i mean yeah. Is it good that some of this shit's being exposed at this point, or do you feel like this will backfire on us? No, for for sure. Um, and you know, the, I think uh, I think we all know what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this has been it's been a mess, but the principle of it is what the industry needs. Um, the the self policing is something that I've talked about, you know, on the podcast that we've done for yeah. the longest time. Because if we don't police ourselves, somebody else will. Um, right. So I, I, the way that it gets political and it, it gets, you know, all the fighting and the bickering and the memes and like it, it gets a little, a little much. Um, but the basis of, you know, we are all in this for the love of the animals primarily. Right. And then, you know, somewhere in the list of priorities falls. This is how we make our living. Uh, or or part of our living and you know for that to be the case there needs to be longevity and for there to be longevity kind of the cancers need to be cut out when they start to grow um, and some of these cancers that are in the industry are very fully developed and have been there for a very long time um, but just because somebody has been you know like like what Kyle said you could be keeping snakes for 40 years and you are fucking terrible at it Right. You, you, you're, you're worse than the, the keeper who just got their first snake. Um, so just because somebody has a, a, a long history and a reputation, um, you know, and they have connections, then maybe they started a morph or a new locality project or, or something like that. That doesn't put them above treating animals well. It doesn't put them above taking advantage of customers. Um, doesn't put them above, you know, I guess in this particular instance, uh, you know, crimes against animals, crimes against people, uh, you know, like grooming and sexual abuse and stuff like that. Like it's, it's really, truly despicable stuff. Yeah. Um, and when everybody can come together in, in, in hopefully in future episodes of this, which inevitably it will happen um, in a way that's a little bit more pragmatic and civil, you know, not backing down, not 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 being harsh in the situation, but to where, you know, the arguments presented to where who who could potentially give a counter that would even be looked at for a second. Um, I uh, but I think this sets a good precedent for a, a, a theme that should be a constant going forward in, in the industry. And, and the the counter argument is always, well, if we put people on blast and share pictures and whatnot. Well, here we're giving, we're giving PETA and HSUS all the, all the ammo they need. Uh, yeah. We're giving them all the ammo they need. If that's the perception of our industry as a whole, if we take, if, if we take the reins first and deal with this internally, that's an even better look on us yeah. as an industry. Um, you know, a, a lot of these, these groups that have, you know, established political power and, and whatnot, you know, they, they didn't do that without self-policing. And a lot of these organizations that have, have gained significant power and influence, you know, they're not the, they're not the most morally upstanding. Um, so a direct comparison might not be the best. Um, but if, if, if all the evidence is shown properly, where you know the the one outlier or the handful of outliers that we think are doing this as wrong as possible are being called out by the people who are doing it right and can actually back that up with their words their actions their animals the way that they they keep you know their mindset always trying to grow and change uh, et cetera et cetera you know that's the look that we need to go for as an industry and i think conversations like we had tonight about you know, the bioactive setups, keeping naturalistic and, and and more than even necessarily just one method versus another. It's that growth mindset within your collection. You know, I mean, I've been keeping reptiles for 13 years now and, and I've always have kind of prided myself on, uh, 
being able to grow and change, listen to new people. If I realize I'm doing something wrong. You have that little ego punch at first that kind of, you know, you get defensive immediately. You want to feel like you're doing right by your animals because at the end of the day you care. And if, you know, for me personally, if I've ever had moments where I'm like, somebody points out something that I'm not doing as well as I can, you take that person right away because you don't want to think that about yourself. You don't want to think that you're doing that to your animals. Take a deep breath, take a step back, analyze the situation for what it is. And now you've just learned one of the most valuable lessons that you've had in a long time. Not only will you benefit from it, your animals will benefit from it. Anybody who buys offspring from you, whatnot, will benefit from it. And then if you share that experience with others, they don't even have to have that negative experience that you did. They can start a, a notch ahead of you. Things like this is what will make the reptile industry have a better face, a better outlook, and uh, you know a better chance of longevity. Am I reaching for saying this? Because I said this on the uh, one of the podcasts I had relating to the, the neglect issue. And <clears throat> I was like, you know, how hard, how hard is it to have an updated video of your collection for somewhere to see? To just to show like this is where how I keep my shit and I got nothing to fucking hide. And, and some people are like, well, that's not fair. Like, you know, certain circumstances, I get it. Like, yeah, sometimes our rooms get a little bit backed up, but still, it should never be that bad when you can't show off your room. You should always, I, don't, I mean, you should always be ready to show off your room, I feel like. Am, am I wrong or am I right? If you can't take a couple of days to pick up everything and have it be. But, I mean, but like, we know what's bad. Like, okay, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. or what's neglect? Like, holy oh, no, shit. What, the, the, like, pictures that, the pictures that all of us saw, you can't fix that. In that's day. what I'm saying. You know, and, and you know, I'm the same way. Everyone's the same way. Life happens. You know, you're yeah. on a vacation. You know, there's there's probably stuff right now that I wouldn't want to take a picture of and post it everywhere. Give me six hours, and yeah, sure. Now now it's perfect. Um, so, you know, I mean that. I, yeah, and like I think Alex, you know, everyone said it, but Alex said it a couple of times. Made a really good point. You know, he has his carrying capacity yeah. where he knows when he exceeds this many animals that what he's doing just starts going downhill. And that's, that's a really good point of self-awareness to have. It's something that I'm working on too, because I, I know for sure right now I have too many animals where I can take fine care of them. They're maybe not completely all breeding the way that I'd like them to. I don't have all of them set up the way I would like them to in an ideal scenario. Um, you know, there's what's worked and then there's what's most ideal. I don't want to use the word perfect because uh, in, with keeping animals that, that doesn't exist, but uh, when, you know, for me, if I find myself in a position where I don't feel like I even have the time to think about innovating how I'm doing stuff, that's when I know something, something's not right. I got to take a step back and analyze everything I'm doing and see what's no longer working for me that may used to have been. Well, I really appreciate you touching on that just because the touchy tip situation right now. And uh, sure. like I said, you're, 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 uh, you're the youth, even though you're old. Weird to say that, but you're just, you know, you, you've been around since a young age, you know what yeah. I mean? So it's yeah. important, I feel like, to hear what you had to say on it, especially because you and I go way back when it comes to podcasts. So um, uh, I appreciate you being here tonight, Stephen. Um, I know you can't tell me when the next show would be, but I know it's going to be somewhere in the near future, I hope so. So uh, I, like I got I, I to say, man, keep doing your thing. Uh, try to grow up less. It looks like you're becoming more of a man and man. It's scaring me. I much, I, I mean, I'd rather you just be little 17 year old Steven who's still big, but, uh, either way, take care of yourself. Tell your dad, Ken, Ken, too, Ken Kush was in the building, called you handsome. So shout out to him Thank and, you, uh, but give it up my boy, Steven Kush. Have a good night, man. I'll see you later. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Peace. <clears throat> All right, guys. Venomous, uh, roundup again in the, in, in the books. What a great time. Steven Kush made this a great time um the guest made this a great time people who watched tonight made this a great time i appreciate all the love and support if this was your first time watching trap talk reptile podcast coolest reptile podcast in the world give this a like if you enjoyed it come on admit it give that a like hit that subscribe button hit that notification bell that way you're on top of every single podcast i drop here on this channel uh, and just a reminder if you uh listen to me on the audio platforms Buzzsprout, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all the major ones. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Um, and again, thank you to everyone in the in the, in the live chats, people who uh, were, you know, showing us some love. I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, but enjoy the rest of your night, guys. It's a wrap. Venomous roundtable for the first time. I thought this was super epic. But uh, enjoy the rest of your guys' night.
See you guys at the top, and I'm out. Cheap.